Excellent. Well, I'm ecstatic to be back. Uh, last time I was here doing this talk uh, was a number of years ago, I mean 2019, and we all know what happened in between now and then. Uh, I'm not going to go over that. But it's, I'm super excited because a lot has happened between now and then, and there's a lot to cover in this deep dive. And for those of you who have not been to one of my talks, uh, we'll spend a lot of time and um, uh, you know, doing demos and so forth. So this is the GraalVM Cloud Native and Micronaut Deep Dive. Uh, if you're confused of where you need to be, you're, on a, you're in the right place. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am, my name is uh, uh, Graham Roche. I'm an architect at Oracle Labs since 2020. I have created a number of uh, open source frameworks over the years. One of them uh, you may have heard of called Grails, and more recently, Micronaut. Uh, you can connect with me on, on social channels, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, and, and follow what we do. Uh, I have been working at Oracle Labs, uh, leading the Oracle Labs' contributions to Micronaut, and we have a significant team now uh, where we contribute code on a daily basis and work on the roadmap for Micronaut and the future and, and invest in making the framework great uh, for all you folks to enjoy. So um, we're going to have a split agenda where we will, um, we will uh, introduce uh, parts of the framework, where we will start with part one, where we'll do introductory material. We will do um, why, the, why Micronaut exists, for those who, who haven't, uh, uh, haven't heard of Micronaut. We will look at some fundamentals. We will look at some of the building blocks that make Micronaut what it is, how to test. And um, then we'll go and look at things like Micronaut AOP, bean validation, events, and listeners, the HTTP server, the Micronaut HTTP client. We'll have a break in the middle of all of this uh, before we get to part three. Um, and uh, we will uh, go into GraalVM, how to build native images, how to deal with reflection, looking at things like Micronaut serialization, how to build doc images, open API specs. And then we'll look at Micronaut data and more recent things like test resources, um, how to do um, Micronaut data with different implementations from JPA to JDBC. And we'll have time for summary, Q&A, and so forth. So let's get going. So in terms of the history of where Micronaut emerged, uh, it was back in 2017, and you know I, I spent uh, I'd spent many many years working on Grails, um, which was based on Spring, and trying to deal with the same problems in terms of optimizing startup foot memory footprint, and um, and uh, memory uh, memory performance, and um, in general uh, those those problems can be summarized by this list. The annotation API in Java was, you know, fairly is fairly limited in that it, it lets you define annotations, but not how to like scan them, not how to search them, not how to index them, not how to query them. Um, in addition to that, generics came later in Java, and uh, you know, have to deal with things like type erasure at runtime. Uh, reflection is uh, historically has been a problem, especially for memory pressure in applications, larger applications. Uh, where you have um, uh, to re read all the reflection information for all the types that represent user code in a framework. Uh, so you can imagine if you've ever done any Spring development, uh, you know, or, or Jakarta EE, you have all these annotations that define the different components of your application, and these um, these have to be scanned and searched, and and reflection has to be used to read them. And uh, when the way reflection works as well in, the, in Java is that it's kind of an all or nothing deal. So um, you basically get all the reflection data or none of it, right? So if you, if you have a class that has 100 methods, it has 100 fields, you get 100 methods and 100 fields stored in soft references. So as soon as you touch it, uh, it's loaded into memory. And that's, this leads to a lot of reflective data caches that end up being duplicated. So you have a lot of duplicate reflection data. You know, if, you think, if you're using uh, typical, if you think of a typical um, application in the Java space, so you've got Hibernate, you've got Jackson, you've got Spring. Each of these uh, 
frameworks, essentially, sub-frameworks use, use uh, build up reflective data caches to perform what they do. Um, class bar scanning is very slow as well because you have to essentially you know, search all the annotated components in a user's code base to find out um, what things form part of the uh, application. And that involves class path scanning. And you can either do it at build time or you can do it at runtime, but historically, this has happened at runtime. Also, there are you know, complex dynamic class loading scenarios. So, you know, historically, frameworks like Spring and so forth had ha have had to support many different class loading scenarios because they have to support deploying to typical uh, traditional servlet containers that have you know, class loader hierarchies and have to support redeployment and deployment. And all of this leads to yeah, a lot of it's you know tremendous amount of respect for the for the the you know for the spring guys and and what you know what we did with Rails in, in working within these these constraints to do everything at runtime because it's challenging to build a framework. It's really hard to like deal with all these problems and get it um, uh, performing well. So I'm not gonna. I already explained why reflection is a problem, but if you want to reference uh, the JDK today is Open JDK, so it's all on GitHub. So do go ahead and check it out. Uh, you can see that in the source code for java.alang.class on that line, uh, basically when you access reflective data, it gets initialized and stored inside of a soft reference, uh, all of the reflection data for all of the class. Um, and uh, you know that's kind of wasteful, right, from, a, from the perspective of a memory consumption. So in general, you know, if you can avoid reflection, you can keep memory cons consumption lower. And if you look at how other um, ecosystems have dealt with this, for example, Java on Android, there's no reflection used whatsoever. But this has never traditionally happened on the server with Java because there's never any kind of need to, you know, who cares? Let's just allocate a gigabyte of memory to the server, right? Uh, let it use all the memory it wants. But um, you know, that's really, really wasteful. We, we have been really, really wasteful when it comes to server-side development of applications. And, um, but you know, many modern, modern frameworks, um, uh, server-side frameworks have um, kind of coupling to reflection and even specifications out there that are coupled to reflection, which is not ideal. Um, and if, we go, if we're looking at now in the Graal VM native image world, where we want to perform like a closed world uh, static analysis of the application, uh, reflection is fully supported by GraalVM. We sh I should just you know make that point that GraalVM fully supports reflection. Um, however, it does require additional configuration, so you have to give hints to the compiler, and that you know all that has to be configured ahead of time before. Um, before, so you know that was the background uh, in terms of what, why we started working on Micronaut, and we started working on Micronaut back in 2017. This was actually before um, uh, Graal VM was open sourced um, uh, officially, and uh, you know we 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 kind of started with a clean slate. We were like, you know, let's how would we build a modern framework that doesn't require reflection, doesn't do dynamic class loading. Uh, doesn't use runtime generated bytecode or runtime generated proxies. You know, how would we achieve this? And we looked at, we actually looked at the Android world and we looked at things like Dagger and annotation processing based technologies. And it turned out, you know, Java has had a fantastic compilation time based API that has existed for, uh, you know, a long time for annotation processing where you can plug into the Java compiler. And uh, so we, we realized, you know, we can just use annotation processing to compute everything that makes a framework work. So, you know, if you haven't, like, looked into the internals of a framework, uh, like Spring or, you know, or um, CDI, you know, it, it basically has to, you know, get all of your classes that form part of your application in a, you know, make a list of them, figure them out. Then it has to reflectively go over all the methods, figure out which ones are annotated with at auto wired or at inject, or uh, and it has to it has to do that at runtime, right? It has to figure out which one of your classes need to be proxied. You know, if you have declarations like at transactional in your source code, what it does, what it frameworks like Spring and, and CDI do is they create a proxy that invokes your code, so it can wrap it in a transaction rollback, and all of these things happen at runtime, right? So with Micronaut, what we wanted to do is use annotation processes and do it all at build time, 
all during compilation, right? So when you run their application, what that means is that you have a lighter, thinner, smaller runtime. The um, and uh, you know you see the results of that when using Micronaut. It's smaller, it's thinner, it's faster, and there's less runtime code, right? So um, you know, uh, just as an example, uh, in the Spring code base, there is a 2,000 line Java class that's there just to resolve generic type information, right? At runtime, it exists it there. And, and, and in Micronaut, that class doesn't exist because we already have the computation of all the types for the generic type information because we can see we process your source code. We can see, hey, this is a list of string. We don't need to go back and work that out at runtime um, based on type erasure. So, um, uh, so the, the compilation time nature of Micronaut is really important and also has other implications uh, apart from a smaller, thinner runtime is that uh, you, you, we, can get, we, can, we can surface error messages to users. You know, so um, when, when you use annotations in a framework, you know, typically you have to put values in them um, to specify a certain information, whether it be, I don't know, um, the uh, URI you want to map to in a, in a REST controller, right? And you can put invalid stuff in there, yeah? Uh, and then at runtime it fails with an exception. Oh, this is what you put. What you input into this annotation is wrong, right? So with Micronaut as well, we do think we do type checking uh, during compilation. So if you use the framework in an incorrect manner, it fails compilation. And um, beyond that, um, Micronaut is also a complete application framework in that you know. From the name, you can probably gather that we have t uh, initially targeted modern architectures like serverless and microservices. But it also can be used with anything that has a static void main. Uh, it's modular. Uh, so the, the core component is a dependency injection module, which, in fact, you know, people have used to build CLI apps, to build desktop apps, to build, um, to even use it in, the, in, in Android apps. So it's very modular. It has a basis which is like a programming model for dependent based on dependency injection, and it uses annotation processing uh, to layer different uh, support components on top of that. So different use cases. So for one of those use cases, for example, is an HTTP client and server based on Netty, but it's not the only um, way to use Micronaut. And uh, the, the the this focus on using compilation time. Uh, has, you know, we're really focused on trying to achieve, because you can achieve low memory footprint um, microservices by using uh, frameworks where you have to do all the kind of hard work yourself of wiring everything together. And some people like that, right? Some people use, you know, raw Netty or raw Vertex or whatever, and they program everything and they wire it together. They don't use dependency injection. But, you know, that doesn't lead to great developer productivity. Developer productivity. So Micronaut is trying to maintain the same developer productivity that you get, but um, uh, in, a, in a faster, leaner, smaller uh, runtime environment. So for, le for each of those problems that I mentioned before, we have a, a solution in Micronaut. So when I spoke about the limited annotation API in, 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 Java, in Java, where you have to access it via reflection, um, so you need to get hold of a method on a class and get it by reflection. And if you want to, for example, figure out uh, what the annotations are of the method that the method overrides, for example, you might have a class hierarchy. You have to traverse up the hierarchy and figure out the superclass method and then get those annotations and traverse up the interface hierarchy if you want to see annotations that are on an interface or that is implemented by the class. You know, all of that is unnecessary with Micronaut because we have pre-computed what we call annotation metadata that for a particular type or a particular method, we compute during the build process and we create a merged view on, on the annotation information so we don't have to traverse the class hierarchy, traverse the interfaces, figure out, uh, for example, is an annotation annotated with another annotation? Sometimes you want to know, you know, one annotation is annotated with another annotation, what's called a meta annotation. We have an API for that where you can figure out, you know, what annotations are annotated with at constraint to figure out all the validation annotations. Or what, 
And all of that is available via the annotation metadata interface. And we have um, pre-computed uh, interfaces to access um, select methods, fields, not, not everything, just the ones that we're interested in, right? So if a particular method is annotated with a particular uh, annotation that we're interested in, we can com calculate all of the generic type information for the return type and the arguments at build time, uh, because we know them, because we can see them, they're in the source code. And uh, in terms of reflection, and I know in the latest JDKs, the, the, the invocation performance of reflection is not so slow anymore because it's using invoke dynamic and it's faster. But we don't have to load the reflective data. So reading the reflective information is, is not, a, not, a di not a big deal. And that doesn't impact startup time and memory footprint because we're not using reflective data caches anywhere in the framework level. <coughs> we don't have to scan the class path um, because everything is indexed during compilation. And Micronaut also uses a complete flat class loader hierarchy. So it just uses the application class loader. So there's no like class loader, nested class loader. You know, I spent so, many, so much time working on Rails debugging like class loader problems because something failed in, in I don't know, uh, during a JBoss's deployment on JBoss's web class loader and, or in Tomcat there was a different class loader or in this there was a different class loader or this scenario was different. And you know, it's just amazing with Micronaut that you never have to worry about class loader problems. It's just always the system class loader, which, uh, which is much simpler, right? Anyway, the, the, the points of all of Micronaut is that you know, the future is, of the way the industry is going, you know, Micronaut has spurned and kind of accelerated this uh, process where you know, after Micronaut came things like Quarkus and now you have Spring Native also work. Is, is basically making more in intelligent compilers, um, more, make the compilers for the frameworks more intelligent, uh, and then you have things like Graal VM native image, uh, which you can convert, do AOT to convert things into native executables. We have all these intelligent compilers, right, <coughs> creating us more and more optimal applications that are slean, smaller, leaner, and thinner at runtime. So if you haven't heard of GraalVM, GraalVM is a high, high performance JDK distribution that uh, comes out of Oracle Labs. It has a JIT mode where that increases throughput, reduces latency, reduces memory usage, et cetera, uh, in terms of uh, you know, a replacement, a JIT compiler for the regular JVM. And it also has a native image for ahead of time compilation, which compiles your applications into self-contained native executables. Now this is awesome because it's allowing Java to go places that were just not possible before. Yeah. So with GraalVM um, native image, it's finally possible to think about using Java in uh, in scenarios like on AWS Lambda or or serverless or command line applications or running low memory footprint on uh, an IoT device, right? All of these scenarios were like not accessible for the Java virtual machine before because you know the overhead of running on 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 those devices um, was too much. With with native image, uh, you can compute an application that is specifically for uh, the architecture it's going to run on. So whether that be Windows, Mac, or Linux, typically Linux in the cloud, <laughs> and uh, it's leaner, sl slimmer, uh, and faster. Now, like I said, the Micronaut already always had a close relationship with, with GraalVM. Actually, Microsoft, Mi Micronaut was open sourced one month before GraalVM was open sourced. And uh, we, you know, we, looked at, we looked at the announcement and we were excited about it. And we were like, you know, what are the requirements to get Micronaut running with, uh, with, native, with native image? And we were like, oh, wow. Well. Uh, you don't. You shouldn't do reflection. You shouldn't do dynamic class loading. You shouldn't do this. And well, you should. If you are going to do it, you should provide configuration. And you know, we're not doing any of this stuff. And it, and it just like worked <laughs> from day one, almost out of the box. Um, and uh, Micronaut and GraalVM are a great combination because there's there's a variety of approaches you can take to supporting native image. Um, so there's different approaches you can take. One approach is to generate all the native image configuration that you need to make the application work, 
right? So that's, that's the approach something like uh, the Spring team are taking with Spring Native, is to basically generate lots of configuration, right, for, for, for native image to, to be able to build the application into a native image. Uh, Micronauts' approach is very different, right? It, its approach is just don't do the things that Graal VM requires configuration for. Right? We just don't do any of it. We don't do reflection, dynamic class loading, uh, you know, runtime proxies. And then there's nothing, there's nothing dynamic about the application. So the closed world static analysis that Graal VM performs just works. Right? Uh, now that doesn't mean that you won't need to provide configuration for third party libraries. Right? So if you're, you're integrating with some third party library, that's outside of the framework, yes, you, you may need to. And for that, we provide a lot of, a lot of different tools. Uh, the Micronaut team has been diligently working on, uh, for example, Graal VM, the official Graal VM Maven and Gradle plugins, right? So the official Graal VM and um, Gradle and Maven plugins are built by the Micronaut team, and they're, they're inbound uh, by, this, by the Spring team in Spring Native, and, um, and they provide like nice integration with things like the tracing agent if you do need to uh, figure out what configuration to provide native image. And more recently as well, we're working on an initiative called Gravium Cloud Native, which is a set, currently is a set of examples and best practices for building cloud portable applications uh, built on the Micronaut framework and GraalVM. It's tested and verified to work together uh, with GraalVM native image. And it's multi-cloud, right? So we were targeting, making sure that GraalVM native applications written with Micronaut work across all the clouds <coughs> without vendor lock-in. So you can find out more at that URL of what we're up to as we work together with the GraalVM native image team. Okay, so let's get started and do, start doing some demos. That's enough, that's enough sli slides and so on and so forth. And start having some fun. So <laughs> how do you get started with Micronaut? So what I have here is I have uh, Visual Studio Code and um, Visual Studio Code uh, is a, you know, an IDE um, that is becoming pretty popular and it's pretty nice. You can, uh, what I have though is some extensions installed. So the key thing is you need the GraalVM tools for Java or the GraalVM extension pack preferably. And that includes all the support that you need to, to build Micronaut applications. Now it's not the only IDE with um, with uh, Micronaut support and GraalVM support. Uh, IntelliJ Ultimate has also fantastic Micronaut and GraalVM support. Uh, in fact, IntelliJ, the latest version, I believe they just added support for native image debugging. Um, so if you're more comfortable with uh, IntelliJ, you know, there's, there's great support there as well. Um, but a nice curiosity about the Micronaut tools and the VS Code extensions is they're actually also developed at Oracle Labs. <laughs> so we, uh, we work together with the, um, the team, a team at Oracle Labs who are building these, these plugins for Visual Studio Code and making them better and thinking about developer productivity and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, um, and what you do, what you, can, what you get when you have them installed is you have some Micronaut tools. And so you can create a new Micronaut project by you know, clicking this button or using the command palettes, I believe. And you can start you know, creating your Micronaut application. Now, this is not the only way to create your Micronaut application. Like I said, IntelliJ also has a wizard. Another option is to go to a browser and you type uh, start.micronaut.io. Uh, and this will take you to Micronaut Launch. Uh, if you, it's currently in light mode, if you like dark mode, you know, whichever one you prefer. And basically this is the UI uh, for generating a Micronaut application uh, and getting started uh, creating your first Micronaut app, right? And it has a, it has a, um, a back end that, uh, so the, the front end is in React, I think, and the back end is, is written in Micronaut itself. Um, and it will generate an application for you and you can choose your version, your language, uh, your build tool, your unit test. You can add some features, uh, you know, like whatever 
Oracle database, if you that's your thing, uh, Oracle database, uh, you know, whatever. Choose your features and click generate, or you can push uh, directly to GitHub. If you have a GitHub account, it'll push the code to your GitHub account and you can get started. Um, so that, the, the interesting thing about Micronaut Launch as well is, like I said, the, back end, the, the, the implementation is written in, in Micronaut itself. And uh, it's an interesting project because we take the same code and we build it into a native image. And we take that native image and we deploy it to, uh, to um, Google Cloud Run as a serverless application. We deploy it to AWS Lambda. We deploy it to Oracle Function. We build it into a command line application that is usable on Windows, Mac, and, and Linux. So we take the same code and we, 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 you know, we build it into a whole bunch of different things with Graalrium native image. So it's really interesting and it's open source. So you can go and check out how the back end for this is, and it's a great example, right? Running Micronaut on, for example, serverless for a serverless environment, right? And, um, and as it happens, the Visual Studio Code tooling here is um, talking to the API, right? So when I said create new app, it's saying, you know, it's basically using the API that we provide to create your application. And you can start creating your application. Um, it has integration with uh, which you know, version of GraalVM you want to include. I'm using Java 17. You can click demo, your package, your language. You can add features if you want directly from here. Like if you wanted to use Micronaut data, you know, there's also database integrations. Uh, for the moment, I'm not going to choose anything. And uh, your build tool your unit testing framework. And then you can stick it somewhere uh, where uh, you want to save it. And it will uh, import into uh, Visual Studio Code. And this is essentially a micro project, right? So um, the, the micro project basically has uh, you know, not many differences to any traditional Java project, right? You have a um, uh, you have a source main Java directory. Uh, one second. Don't know why. Yes, I think I didn't click the trust button. That was why. <laughs> okay. So, um, so you know, it'll it'll take a little while to import the project, but basically, uh, there is a uh, application class uh, that you have, which is basically the main entry point for your application. Uh, so, there's an application .java. It has a main method, and it calls uh, micronaut run. Uh, there, are, I chose Gradle, uh, but I, if I chosen Maven, then it would give me a pom pom.xml. But I chose Gradle, so I get a build.gradle. Whichever build tool you want, you know we support uh, both, uh, Maven and Gradle. Um, so I have a build Gradle, and basically it has, you know, my dependencies. Um, we have some plugins for both Maven and Gradle. So this this has a Gradle plugin at the top, which basically configures Micronaut. Uh, but Micronaut doesn't actually need plugins, or, you know, either Maven or Gradle plugins. It's just an annotation processor. So these are more like a convenience feature. Uh, if you don't want to use the plugins, you can just you know specify the annotation processes manually. Um, but yeah, this is the the build .gradle. and um, there is a test directory where we create like a test, um, <coughs> and this is using uh, Micronaut test. So we have a test project, and I think this just tests that the application starts up correctly. There is a source main resources directory where you'll find configurations. So there's an application.yaml. And here you can modify your uh, application. Uh, so for example, in here you can you know, specify things like the port. The ID is quite, quite nice because we get you know, code completion of what's available and like documentation, uh, for example, of um, you know, what, what each configuration thing does. Uh, but yeah, you can set the port 8081 or you know, hard card the port, the port, whatever. And uh, this is a basic structure of a micro application. So uh, you know, you can run in here, and you can write your you run run your first integration test, and uh, you can see how fast that took to execute. Now, 
this is one of the big things with, with Micronaut when you come from Spring or, or, other, uh, or Grails or other frameworks, is that uh, test execution of integrations tests is like super fast, right? Um, uh, and this, this, this influenced the design of the framework quite a lot. So we don't have a, uh, like a mocking framework or an extensive one, like, like, because generally Micronaut starts so fast that you write a lot of integration tests, right? So, so on, on the back end for Micronaut launch, for example, we have thousands of, of tests, right? And they run really, really fast because uh, the design of it being fast to start up means that your tests are fast to execute and that helps develop a productivity because you're executing tests and getting that feedback in a, in a fast loop. Um, now, uh, we do have Micronaut Test, which is, supports both JUnit 5 and uh, Spock. And all it does is basically uh, it bootstraps Micronaut uh, inside your JUnit 5 test and lets you inject components using at inject or also, it also works with uh, parameters. So you can, act, I don't actually even need the inject. I can just inject it into my JUnit5 method and actually get rid of that annotation altogether and run that again. And that will, uh, that will work just, just, as fine, just fine as well. So any, th this embedded application interface is something that you can dependency inject into your code. Uh, and you can, we'll talk more about dependency injection in a minute. But basically, or in terms of Micronaut test, all it does is start Micronaut and allow you to inject components into your test methods and, and so on and so forth. And it's, and it's really fast, right? Uh, so that's how you basically get started creating your first Micronaut application. So like I said, um, you can go to uh, start.micronaut.io. It also has an API that works through curl. So if you, wanna, if you want, you can do curl and then the URL start.micronaut.io and then spit it out to a zip file and you, you have a, a project. Yeah. Um, integrated wizards is available for IntelliJ and VS Code. There's also a command line utility, which I have installed, it's called MN. It's like an optional extra. Um, uh, so uh, if I go to terminal here, I actually have uh, MN installed. And it's interactive, so you can open it up. But it's not required to use the framework, right? This is an optional, you can install it via SDK main if you want it. It's not needed for the framework. And it, 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 has thing, it adds like code generators, so you can create uh, you know, controllers and, and, and components of your application. If anybody has ever used Grails, that's very inspired by <laughs> the way Grails used to work. Um, so, or still works, I imagine. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's really easy to get set up and there's command line utilities available. So Micronaut test, uh, is, like I said, is the testing library. You add it to your test class path. We have implementations for Spock, JUnit 5, and Kotlin test. Um, if you're a Kotlin user, you add it to your build and you, you're automatically ready, ready to start testing. And you can dependency inject uh, components into your test and assert the results. <coughs> it also spins up, so that's one thing that is maybe not entirely uh, apparent, and we'll, you'll see it more as, as, we, as we build out the application, but it, it spins up the, the entire HTTP server um, in the background, so you can send requests to it. Okay, so now we're going to look at uh, one of the core kind of building blocks of, of Micronaut, which has been introspections. Okay, so any framework out there um, needs to be able to uh, read um, and write to properties of a, typically, a, historically it's been Java beans and, and more recently we have records. But essentially, you typically have these classes that represent uh, your data, data objects in, or your domain model, right? So for example, in, 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 uh, in Hibernate, you have classes that are annotated with at entity, um, and they have you know getters and setters on fields. Or, for example, you have some classes to represent your JSON um, inputs and outputs, and you, you know, you, and they, those need to be serialized and deserialized from JSON. So, uh, so these are the kind of classes where you model kind of attributes, right? Uh, and any framework has to, you know, that doesn't support reflection. Uh, you know, the traditional way to do this is you get the class, you get all the methods that are declared in the class, 
iterate reflectively over the fields. Uh, then you get all the instance you, you know, to read them. You use the reflective methods to invoke and get the values from all the all, uh, from the object, and and you basically then can write those out to JSON or or the database or read them from the database and input. So uh, it's kind of a fundamental pillar or building block that makes the framework work. Right, being able to read objects and write ob read to and write to objects. Right. So uh, well, this is one of the first problems we, we had to tackle with Micronauts. How do we do this uh, without using a reflection? Um, so we came up with what we call bean introspections. Now, uh, if you want to know where the name came from, there is a type in the JDK called the intro introspector. It's, it's called uh, java.beans.introspector. And I think they, they stripped it out with the module system because I think it's like it has all sorts of dependencies on AWT and all sorts of other things like UI related. But it was basically, basically you know, Spring used this. It, it, ha it has an API to like get hold of like the bean info for, for a particular type. And then, you know, with the Java bean specification, you could get hold of like the, the properties of the type and and you know all sorts of information about what 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 attributes a uh, Java bean exposed, right? Um, so it's called Java.beans.introspector, and you know I think in, in recent versions of a Spring they have eliminated using this class, but historically, like you know, Spring used it to figure out the, the properties of a Java bean, right? So that's where the name bean introspection comes from. And so how does it work? So in Micronaut. So in Micronaut, uh, you will have um, uh, you'll have a type. Let's create one, and let's call it pet, for example. Um, there. Uh, so here's my pet class, and you know maybe it has a name, maybe it has an age, maybe we have like some enum or something in an enum that represents the pet type. Maybe we have like dog and cat, you have know, dogs or cats, uh, something like that. And then we have, you know, pet type and then the type. Uh, then that does the attributes. And then we would have like getters and setters, right? This is the historical way before Java 17 records came along. And it's probably still the way, you know, a lot of systems will work in the future. Uh, so here we have a introspect, uh, what, uh, uh, what is a POJO with some getters and setters, right? So now um, I want to create an instance of this pet type, right? But at the framework level, right, to be able to read and write this type to JSON or read and write from database, I need to be able to like dynamically read the name um, and so forth. So the way you can do that in Micronaut is to add annotation, uh, introspected on the type, right? Now you don't typically add this annotation explicitly uh, on the type because it typically it's used as a meta annotation. So it might be uh, like, for example, if you are using uh, Hibernate and with Micronaut and JPA, everything that's annotated with at entity is implicitly annotated with at introspected, so we can read and write those. Or um, uh, if you're using Micronaut serialization, you would use uh, at serializable and or deserializable, and basically it would implicitly add it, right? And what that does is, let, let's have a look at what that does. So actually, I'm, uh, it, it actually can be used without spinning up Micronaut at all. So you can actually remove Micronaut test altogether uh, for, for a bit. And uh, what that lets you do is you can do bean introspection dot get introspection pet to look up a introspection for a particular type, right? So that'll give me the introspection, right? And um, the introspection, you can use, then use it to say, instantiate me a new instance of pet. Right, there it is. And uh, from the introspection, you can also say, get required property name. And I expect the type of uh, the property to be a string. And it's use a variable there for the property. Right, let's call it prop. There we go. Uh, okay. There we go. So, and using that property, you can say prop uh, set pet. Uh, let, let's call it uh, Dino. Right. 
And uh, then we can say at an assertion here, assertions set equals equals uh, Dino. I expect it to be Nino. Uh, pet dot get name. All right. So let's run that and see if that works. And it does, right? So what's happening here? What's happening on this code, right? So basically, uh, I get an inspection. Uh, it lets me dynamically, dynamically, supposedly, instantiate an instance of pet. It lets me retrieve one of the known properties of pet and use that property to set a value. And we assert, we do the assertion at the end to assert the value or set. Uh, so how did that, that work without using reflection? So the way it works is if we go into our build directory in here, build classes, main, uh, oh, did I put it in the wrong place? Yeah, okay, so I put my pet into my test, uh, <laughs> the tree structure, so we'll have to move it in a minute. But you can see that basically for the pet type over here, it generates additional classes that sit along, Micronaut that is, generates additional classes, and they're called uh, dollar pet in, dollar introspection, that are built during the compilation phase, and they know uh, how to instantiate a pet, what the properties, available properties are. For example, you know, I'm just getting a single property here, but you can also say introspection, got get, get uh, bean, pro bean properties, and you can get all of the available ones, for example, and you can get them all, right? Uh, so it has all the information that I need about what a, um, a, a what the properties of a pet are. Uh, so I don't know if I can actually move things. Yeah, probably I can just do this. Let's move it over there. Okay. Uh, so so that. Um, that is essentially a bean inspection, right? And now it allows us also to solve a lot of um, a number of challenging problems, right? Uh, because you know we have to, you know, the way the way it works in the Java.beans or introspector uh, APIs at runtime, it uses reflection, but then it has to iterate over all the methods and figure out which which uh, which like our methods kind of match up the get name and the set name has to work that out at runtime, you know, get name and set name are, are pairs and they relate to a name property and this is like these conventions, if it starts with get and it starts with, you know, so there's all this Java being get convention that we can all move that computational logic into the build phase. And another key thing that allowed us to do was, it's very typical in frameworks, right? Uh, historically to say, I don't want uh, the name to be, a, to be blank, uh, I want it to have a size that is a maximum of 100 or something it's like that, right? Um, and you see how these annotations are, are applied on the private field, right? So they're applied on the private field, and that means that like, for, the fr for a framework to make this work, it has to actually go in and effectively match up the private field called name with the method, with a set getter and set name and get name pair, and figure out that, that that field has annotations on it. And then you have to deal with the, all the edge cases. So what happens if there's not blank and there's also uh, annotation on the method? You know, how do I deal with that? Now the framework has to figure out it has, a, it has one annotation on the field and it has one annotation on the method. And I need to fuse those together into a single annotation view because they both relate to the same thing, which is the name property, right? So we don't have to do any of that in Micronaut runtime because it computes it all at compilation time. Right? The whole computation of this, it, it normalizes the annotations. So it'll look at the private field, it'll look at the name, it'll, it'll, and it'll fuse it. And it will do it all automatically for you. Um, and we have an API where you can say, you know, uh, you know from the property, uh, give me the annotation metadata, like all of it. Give me all the annotation metadata for that property. Uh, and give me uh, all of the annotation values that have been annotated with a particular stereotype, in this case, constraint. And uh, I think that has to be constraint name. 
uh, get me all the annotation values on that property that are meta annotated with constraints. So how does that work? So basically, an annotation like not blank and an annotation like size, they are meta annotated with constraint, right? So a lot of frameworks like Spring and, what, and Jakarta EE, at runtime, they have to compute this fact. They have to realize, oh, the size annotation is meta annotated with the constraint annotation, and the, 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 so is the, you know, the, the, the not blank annotation. They have to create this like map at runtime of, uh, of what is annotated with what, right? And we don't have to do any of that in Micronaut because it happens at build time. So this is, how, this is what I was m talking about when I was saying keeping the runtime small you know, is challenging with frameworks. With, Mic with Micronaut, the, the compiler is very sophisticated, but the runtime is very thin and light and small and, and lightweight, right? And, th and this is the goal. So, so, uh, so introspections are like a key pillar. And, and, more, and you know, more recently, now, with Java 17 uh, being out, which is, which is awesome, we have uh, records, right? So this is the other, the other really nice thing about having a shared model, right? So records are slightly different, right? We have, uh, we, you can have a record nowadays, and you know, we can instead, instead of having all these getters and setters and stuff, you know, we can get rid of all that, and it's you know, a, lot of, a lot of noise, a lot of verbosity, and you know, we can put all these here as what they call record components. So these can now be record components, right? Like so. Um, and now I have now I now I have a record. Um, and you know, but we so we have to deal with this case as well. Records are clearly not the same as Java beans with getters and setters. They're a different structure. They're an immutable type. They have a, a constructor. Um, you can immediately see the difference because my test is failing to compile, right? So they don't have get name methods. They have a name method that you call to get the value. So you know I've changed the structure of my class. Um, if I run this test, I anticipate that in fact this will in fact fail, and it will fail. Um, it fails because I'm trying to instantiate um, the uh, the record, and it requires constructor arguments, right? So I, I cannot actually uh, instantiate it because the, other, the previous one had constructor arguments. Now this one, I actually have to provide some values here. Uh, you know, maybe Dino 10 or something, and pet type uh, uh, is a dog, whatever. And uh, so I actually have to uh, provide those. But I can work with the same model, more or less, of bean introspections. And actually, it's still failing. And why is it failing now? It's failing because <coughs> uh, records are immutable. right? I cannot just go in and set the Dino property because this is an immutable type. So we have ev evolved the same model to allow working with records, where instead of saying set property, you say with value, and you pass in the pet, and you get a new instance of pet back. right? And uh, if we run that again, uh, now it passes, right? Because what we're doing is, at compilation time, we're automatically generating the logic that you need to do a copy constructor approach to populate a new value and return a copy of the record uh, with the value. A traditional framework would have to do all of this at runtime, dynamically, reflectively, you know, basically find the constructor to do the copy constructor approach at runtime using reflection, you know, copy all the values at runtime, and you know, we we basically generate a direct constructor invocation call that just provides the new value and all the existing values. And it's way simpler, right? It's way simpler for the runtime. It's way simpler um, for the application itself. So, uh, so yeah. Um, all of that is really easy. So being introspections are like a fundamental building block of the way the framework works. And, 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 and introspections are used everywhere in the framework. So um, they are an AOT reflection-free replacement for java.beans or introspector. They include the metadata. They work with records. And they're used throughout the framework. So uh, we, recently, we, re we released Micronaut serialization which uh, I'll talk about as well, which is like a replacement for Jackson, where you can serialize and deserialize JSON without using a reflection. They use introspections under the covers. We have built Micronaut data, 
Um, Micronaut Data allows you to read and write objects using Micronaut Data JDBC to a relational database. Uh, that uses introspections under the cover so that you, when you communicate to a database back and forth, uh, we're not using reflection at any point when you're reading and writing data to the database. So introspections are like a fundamental building block of the framework, and that's why I'm, I'm banging on about them so much. Uh, but it's a key thing to understanding the way Micronaut works. So it lets, lets you read and write properties. And like I said, they are foundational for the framework. It computes all the annotation information. And uh, we, compu you compute, we compute things like the stereotypes. Like I said, is, an, another, is, is this method annotated, annotated with, with, with an annotation, or is it meta-annotated with an annotation? So that's what we call a stereotype. So if an annotation is not directly present on the particular method, but it's meta-present, right? Um, and it's a merged uh, compilation time computed replacement for the reflection API and includes knowledge of all the meta annotations. And the, it's immensely powerful, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, it, it features something called, the compiler features something called annotation mappers, for example. And uh, so, you know, it drives me nuts, nuts where I already done the demo of annotation metadata, but it basically drives me Dutch nuts where you have in the Java ecosystem, right? For as a framework author, you have nullable annotations everywhere, right? You have you have Java Java X annotation nullable. You have the Kotlin version, which is org.jetbrains nullable. You have Finebugs, which defines its own uh, nullable annotation. Spring has its own nullable annotation. Uh, Micronaut. Yes, also has its own <laughs> nullable annotation. So there's nullable annotations everywhere. And like, if you want to figure out, can I set this thing to null? And you're a framework. Yeah, you and you and you and you're you're a framework. So I'm I'm Spring or I'm CDI or I'm. Yeah, you know, I want to figure out, can I set this thing to null legally to be, to maintain the semantics of this application? You have to write logic in that your framework that says, if it's Java X dot nullable do this. If it's uh, JetBrains is nullable, then, then it's okay. If it's, uh, otherwise you can just say get simple name, you know, try and just get the simple name and just write an assumption that says any annotation that's called nullable, then, you know, just, just assume that it can be nulled, right? And, and it, drives, it drives you nuts because, and this is one of the fundamentals, so with Micronaut you can actually transform at compilation time, so at runtime there's only one nullable annotation. <laughs> Which is cool, right? Because you only you only have to check, uh, you know, one annotation. You don't have to check the 50 different variations that exist in the Java ecosystem. And don't get, even get me started on, on logging systems, but I won't go there. Um, but it also lets us support uh, like things like JavaX and Jakarta simultaneously. Simultaneously, you know. So when when they renamed JavaX annotation nullable to Jakarta annotation nullable, you know, there was no problem with Micronaut. It just yeah, we just added another mapper, maps it all to the same thing. Um, and it's also uh, the way we support things like in Micronaut, you can actually use the spring annotation set. So there's a module in Micronaut where you can go in and you can add it and you can configure it and then you can, then you can carry on using, if you, if you really love the spring annotations, you can use at get, map, get mapping and at rest controller and at auto wired. And we just transform those into Micronaut's versions, right? Okay, so that's fundamental building block number one. So this next fundamental building block of Micronaut is dependency injection. So, you know, I'm not gonna go into the debate of why you should or shouldn't use dependency injection. Like from my, my perspective, dependency injection has been absolutely critical for in, in the Java community for the construction of modular systems that are easy to test. You know, things like Spring got popular because Ultimately, you know, it makes it possible for you to write simple Java code that is testable inside of a unit test, that is extensible, so that modular, so that you can swap in components, different implementations, different databases, different messaging systems. Um, so it, it's been absolutely key, and Micronaut is, is no different. It has a dependency injection implementation, and, uh, well, I'll just go ahead and do the demo. <laughs> so, um, so the way it works is, um, it's pretty simple, right? So, you know, I can have, like, for example, over here in my application, I can have a, you know, let's call it pet repository. You might gather why it's going to be calling that uh, for 
for later, but basically, uh, so this is a class, and maybe it's going to have a method uh, where it's going to like list, you know, all of the pets uh, in the system, and we're going to use. Um, uh, oh, hold on, I've got an extra angle bracket that's making it unhappy. Okay, so and we're going to do a list of, and uh, we're going to have new pet. Uh, do you know, like 10. One really nice feature of records actually is you can come in here, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you can actually have uh, secondary constructors with records, and this is quite nice. You know, so if you don't want to provide all the values every time you want to construct something, you can do stuff like have a, a secondary uh, constructor that provides like some defaults for like the things that you don't want to supply, right? Um, and that's quite nice, right? So, uh, so now I can like simplify my code a bit here and you know just assume everything is a dog for the moment. Um, uh, I don't know, just name some pets, whatever. Um, so here is a component in my application, right? That lists some some data. You know, theoretically, it could be talking to a database. It's not as case okay, maybe it's just using in-memory data structures. Uh, so if, if I wanted to make this component a uh, available for dependency injection to anywhere else, the minimum requirement in Micronaut is to to define a scope, right? So uh, this is you know more or less the same as. CDI and other things, uh, and, and Micronaut is JSR 330 dependency inject compliant. So I just define a scope, uh, in this case singleton, which means there's only going to be ever one of them on the type. Um, and that means I can dependency inject this into uh, something else. Uh, it's available for dependency injection, right? Uh, so what can I, so let's see how we do that. So, you know, if I have another type here, and let's call it pet controller. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this is going to be like a web controller thing. And we'll talk more about the web layer in a minute. But basically, um, there's a number of different ways that we could, like, inject my pet service or pet repository into this. One way you could do is you could do something like this. You could say in, at inject, which is what we saw, saw before, pet repository, repository, and you inject it, and then you know you, you use it somewhere. Uh, you know to, in this case, we're, you know it's pretty simple. We're just like delegating whatever. Um, so that's one way to do dependency injection, right? Where we can use at inject, and Micronaut will make sure that's fulfilled, and it will inject it and make it available uh, to be used. And that's essentially the fundamentals of a dependency injection. Now, I don't actually like this pattern. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, there's different ways to do dependency injection. Um, this, this one I don't like because, uh, uh, personally, because one, it needs an annotation. Um, so you have to have an extra import up here. Uh, the other thing is that it doesn't really clearly express the requirements of the class for me. Uh, so, um, you know, this class clearly requires the repository to function correctly. Um, so, uh, and if I instantiate this guy and I don't set this, then I get a null pointer in here, which is like if I instantiate it directly. That, that's not nice. Uh, so, in general, what I, what I prefer is immutability and and, uh, and constructor injection. So you can generate a constructor, and you can, and then you can get rid of that import, and uh, and then you have uh, a Micronaut will automatically inject this into uh, the constructor argument. And this is much much better because now I know that I can't instantiate this guy without this guy. Uh, if 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 it was possible to instantiate. Uh, this uh, the pet controller without the pet repository, then you can express that through like things like nullable. You can say that yeah, this is allowed to be null, and yeah. and you know more null safe, right? Uh, it's it's it, it's better better in general. Um, so so uh, now, uh, how do you get hold of pet controller now? In general, when you use when you're building you're using frameworks like Micronaut and Spring, you don't directly get hold of pet controller, right? The framework gets hold of it and it wires it routes. 
the uh, the HTTP call directly to the to a method in the class, and you don't directly instantiate it. But you can uh, you can if you want to, right? So for example, I could inject pet controller in here like so, and um, uh, into my test uh, de using dependency injection, and I could control call the controller and uh, you know, we get a result back, and we can add our assertion here that says this should be you know, size two or something like that, and uh, replace that with, with a static import so it looks prettier. And then we we run that, and uh, it doesn't work for some reason. Uh, okay, so why is it not not? Let's see, so parameter resolution. Um, hmm. That's weird. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, that's why somebody's awake. See, this is the cool thing about live coding demos that you get help from the audience. So uh, you, of course, have to annotate it with at micronaut test to get dependency injection. Right. Uh, there we go. There we go. So we got participation. Thank you very much for the audience help. So uh, there we go. So uh, my inner test, why is it in there? And yeah, it, well, the error was like it was failing to resolve the parameter or whatever. So there we go. So it wired in there, it, you know, delete the, when, and it wired that, then Microsoft wired the pet repository, and it, you know, your application gets dependency injected together. Now, one of the differences between Micronaut and anything else is that the way things are wired together are built at compilation time, right? So uh, whilst we've been developing, Micronaut has been at compilation time, you know, figuring out how things are wired together, but the they are actually still wired together at runtime. So, you know, at runtime, things are actually wired together, but at compilation time, we build the how things are wired together, uh, which is important. Uh, so, that, you know, that's dependency injection. Now, uh, like, like I said, Micronaut test was doing the hard work there for me, but you can, uh, you can um, do it yourself. So, you know, so if you want to integrate Micronaut somewhere else, you can say application context run, and you can wrap this in a try with the resources block, which is already always nice. Uh, so you can say uh, application context uh, run something like that. I think it is. Oh no, that should be an equals. Um, so the, the reason for try with the resources is that you can it'll shut down the context at the end. So if you have any, for example, database connection pools or anything like that, Micronaut will, will shut shut it down at the end. Uh, so. Uh, and then you can use like this is essentially what Micronaut uh, is doing in the background. In, in Micronaut test is doing in the background. And then you can use the context to say, get me a component from here. You can say, I want pet controller class, and you you get it back. Um, and there we go, right? Uh, so this is how, with the absence of Micronaut test, you would write you would write uh, tests. And in fact, for a very long time, uh, for, uh, for the few first few years of the framework's existence, we actually did not even have Micronaut tests. Right? It was, all of our tests were, were basically like this, right? or you know, if you wanted to write integration tests, or whatever. Um, and there were ways that you could do it like manually with, with JUnit 5 or, or Spock or whatever. But you know that's basically how you uh, spin up the, which brings us to the the notion of the application context. So what is that? So the application context, uh, if you're familiar with Spring, is very similar, right? It is a container object that holds all of the components. So you can say, you know, it contains mean. You can. It has an environment. Uh, so you can do things like get environment, and you know. Get hold of the environment, and you can say, you know, from there, what are the active environments? Uh, you can resolve properties from there, and uh, you can get, you know, get a bean, what's called a bean definition. So I can get hold of a bean definition for pet controller, for example, uh, and get get hold of the definition of what that bean is, and uh, using that definition, I can, for example. Um, Get the uh, injected injection points, the injected fields, and injected methods, and 
and all of this, and that's and a bean definition is actually what is produced in the compilation phase, right? It's a bean definition which describes how to wire together the bean, right? Um, so, uh, so yeah, the context is pretty key, um, and you know it's an interface. If you're familiar with Spring, you'll be comfortable with because it's the same interface name in Spring, and um, and the environment, yeah, it represents the active environment. Which brings me to uh, configuration, injection, and binding, uh, and so off, so forth. So, uh, so um, uh, you can also do configuration properties, binding, and, and injection. So, for example, if this was a pet store, I don't know, and I'm over here, and I, and I maybe I, I can create like um, a. Uh, a store configuration, right, or something like that. And uh, these, these can actually be records as well, which is really nice. So I can make, an, I can have like, uh, I don't know, if this is a pet store, uh, maybe we have like a, a double minimum price or, or something like that. Um, uh, and then you can bind those values for, um, and, you know, and maybe you have settings like app max inventory, uh, you know, that kind of th stuff. And then you can say at configuration properties store, you know, pet dot store, something like that. And then, um, and then uh, you can come into your application .yaml and you can say, um, what did I call it? Uh, Pet dot store, right? So, so then you can say like uh, pet dot, no, and you can use like nested config store dot um, max inventory, something like that. Um, yeah, well, maybe a hundred pets or something like that. Uh, min, did I say min price? Min price, yeah. Uh, min price, you know, ten whatever, um, or ten point. 99, I don't know. Um, uh, and, then, and then basically you can independently inject the, uh, and we'll go back and we'll get rid of this and we'll reinstate micronaut test. It's just easier. Uh, and add an import for that. And then you can inject the store configuration and uh, micronaut will automatically wire from uh, the configuration you know the the inventory and uh, and uh, all all the different values, um, and it's uh, it has an algorithm that's very similar in you know very you know different frameworks, which is, oops, max inventory, right, uh, something like that, right, um, which is very so so basically you know it will. You know, this is just one source. Uh, you can also specify environment variables, system properties, and there's like precedence, right? Um, so uh, environment variables take precedence over local configuration, and and you can basically make your application fully configurable and dynamic. Um, and you know, if, if, uh, we have you know, if it integra integrates with the rest of the management infrastructure and our cloud distributed configuration mechanisms. So if you're using distributed configuration via like some distributed configuration source, whether it be Oracle Cloud Vault or Kubernetes config maps or AWS parameter store, we can pull in configuration from all these different sources. And if possible, we can monitor it, you know? So um, you can do like, uh, you can watch a, a Kubernetes config map and automatically uh, refresh this type uh, so it'll destroy the instance and recreate it if uh, if the configuration changes uh, by Kubernetes, potentially avoiding a container pod restart, um, and so on and so forth. So it's it's a very flexible uh, mechanism, uh, and uh, dependency injection, like I said, is a key building block of of Micronaut. So um, Micronaut DI, uh, it's based on JSO three thirty. Uh, we support uh, post construct and pre-destroy. We also worked uh, on. I worked with the CDI specification process to define CDI 4s light 
profile and we're working towards passing the TCK. So, uh, but we, um, so we may support, you know, CDI Lite in, in the future, uh, once, we, once we get to the point of passing all the TCK. And uh, it's completely reflection free and fast. Uh, you have an application context, which is your container object. You can do type safe configuration. Um, and I, I demonstrated records, but it also works with Java Bean properties. It also works with interfaces. So if I define an interface, like in this case, example configuration with get name, it'll, it'll work with that as well. And it also has ways to import configuration objects from other systems because not all configuration you define. Sometimes configuration is defined from somewhere else or etc. Um, and another key part of Micronaut is the notion of conditional beans or conditional um, logic. So uh, for example, you know, I might have uh, over here my pet repository, right? Um, and this implementation, for example, is, going, is destined to run um, on, on, on AWS and it's going to talk to, uh, you know, uh, some RDS or something like that. And I have another one, I have another implementation of this class that's going to run on Oracle Cloud and it's going to talk to autonomous database, right? So you can, you can define uh, bean requirements. So I can say this one requires the environment uh, Oracle Cloud for example. Um, and it will be activated only if the Oracle Cloud environment is detected. And we have automatic detection of the, the environment that you're running in. So if you run in AWS, it'll say, hey, I'm running in AWS. If you're running in Oracle Cloud, it'll say, hey, I'm running in Oracle Cloud. And the application will start up. And you can rewire your application to behave differently <coughs> based on the presence or absence of, for example, the environment. Uh, that's one option. But uh, if you don't want to like, if, if you don't want to think about clouds, you know, you can also say, uh, you know, I don't know, this one is an in-memory one. So we say in-memory store enabled value equals true. And this component will only be activated if the in-memory store is enabled. So maybe that's useful like for, for like testing or you have an in-memory implementation and in production, you're running it against an actual real relational database and you activate that and you can define requirements. And you can also say, you know, things like that's based on the property, but you can also say, you know, this, this one is only active uh, when my pet database interface, uh, which doesn't exist, uh, is present. Um, and uh, and I'm, then I get pet, pet, pet database in here and if it's not present, you know, do something else. Um, so you can have, you know, a conditional bean logic and have your application rewired differently. Um, and that's, you know, really important in the cloud, right? Because you need to be able to rewire your application in different ways. Um, I'm quite, quite far behind, but anyway, so, uh, so what, what else do we have? So, uh, Micronaut AOP. So Micronaut AOP is also, um, a uh, critical part of, of, of Micronaut. So it's a, um, a, you know, when you think about frameworks, and actually before we, uh, we go on to Micronaut AOP, uh, I think we have, um, I think it might be good to have a quick break. And then in 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, we will uh, resume uh, with the rest of the presentation. Um, uh, so I'll give you guys 10, 15 minutes and uh, just looking at the timings of how we're going and then we'll uh, continue at uh, the top of the hour at three o'clock. Okay. Okay, hopefully everybody is getting settled back in. So we're gonna go through some of this other, uh, material on Micronaut AOP because, uh, quickly so that we can get through some, some more interesting details. But uh, the other major fundamental building block is Micronaut AOP. So uh, it comes from, um, well, again, a lot of the terminology that existed in, in previous frameworks, uh, you know, basically a support for interceptors, uh, differences in comparison to things like 
um, spring and CDI uh, and so forth is designed to be reflection free and, and not to generate runtime proxies, right? So no bytecode generation, no runtime generation of proxies. And um, that leads to, because every, all the method of invocation between the framework and when it invokes your code is um, direct method invocation. It leads to smaller stack traces that are, that are easier to debug. And it, it allows for the, the typical use cases that you see frameworks which featuring. Uh, probably the most famous one is at transactional, right? I, want, I have a method, I want to wrap it in transaction management. If an exception is thrown, I want to roll back the transaction. If, a, if no exception is thrown, I want to commit the transaction, right? But there are others. There's like cacheable validation and so forth. And another fundamental building block which AOP is linked to is the notion of sometimes a framework needs to be able to invoke your code, right? And this is why I said we don't want to scan for all of the available java.lang.reflect.methods. So instead, we have a message annotation which is used which you don't normally see directly in your code, but it's called at executable. You can add it to a method, and it generates a compilation time method handle that allows us to invoke your code. Um, in terms of micro AOP, there's different types of AOP that you can, uh, you can define, and you can define them in your own code, uh, or the framework can define them. Uh, some people you know, implement their own uh, logging or tracing implementation using a round advice where it essentially de decorates the behavior of a method, wrapping behavior around the method, uh, surrounding it in new, new behavior. So that's things like caching, transactions, tracing, logging, etc. You might want to implement your own. <coughs> uh, introduction advice is inter interesting, which is about introducing new behavior to something that is abstract or not implemented yet. And we'll look at how a uh, use case of where that's used. And then we also have adapter, which allows you to adapt uh, a method into another interface. Uh, so there's, these are all kind of fundamental building blocks of the way the framework works. So around is the most typical one though, and it's the most well understood one and common. Uh, you add an annotation on the method and it intercepts the invocation and does something. So re retriable, there's an annotation in retriable and Micronaut features resiliency annotations like to retriable and, and circuit breaker. Uh, you know, invoke the method, if it fails, try again, invoke it until you reach the, the retry threshold and then give up and rethrow the original exception, right? Uh, so that's retry. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no, with Micronaut, there's nothing, no kind of fancy proxy factory beans or anything or, or E containers needed to make this work. It all just gets computed at build time. Uh, so the way you would do this yourself if you were writing an application uh, or your own advice or your own interceptor is basically you create an annotation, in this case retriable, and you meta annotate the annotation with at around. And then you define a method interceptor that matches that annotation name. And every time the method is invoked, your interceptor will be called first, and then you receive a context object. And with that context object, you can either click, you can either call proceed, or you can not call proceed and do something else, right? Um, introduction advice is the same. Uh, you apply it to an interface, which has no logic implemented yet, and the logic is provided to you by the framework. So this, the classic example of this is the HTTP client, the decorative HTTP client in Micronaut, where you say, on this interface, I want an HTTP client to be implemented for me. And Micronaut goes away in a compilation time and builds a uh, HTTP client that will, uh, for each method that's not implemented, uh, provide the logic to invoke, um, invoke the remote endpoint. Um, and again, the way you would basically do one of these yourself is you define the same process. You define an annotation, you annotate it with that introduction, you define an interceptor that's going to intercept the abstract logic, and you implement the logic. Um, it's really that simple. Uh, you wouldn't call proceed in this case with the context object, because if you call proceed, there's nothing implementing it, and it'll actually be an error. But basically, you provide the logic yourself, right? You're the last... Uh, uh, interceptor in the chain, and there's a chain. You can order these so that things come before and after. 
And this is all this at the basis of Micronaut validation, right? So Micronaut's validation infrastructure, which I already showed you some of, um, is a um, is uh, is based on this. So it's based on. So for example, in my application over here, you know, if we added a method that was going to save a new pet, you know, to our in-memory database, which doesn't exist at this point. Um, we may want to validate the arguments, right? So we may want to say, you know, that shouldn't be blank, and uh, you know, it should be size, whatever, uh, 100, and the age should be a positive number. Um, so we, we, you know, in order for this to work, Micronaut has to, you know, intercept this method call and apply validation rules. So how do you do that? You add, you tell Micronaut that this is validated. Uh, this is validated, and then if I come into my demo over here, and I inject the pet repository, and and we come over here, and we try and inf feed it some invalid data, like a blank string or a negative number, um, and we run that, uh, this will likely fail, right? Uh, which it does, right? It fails with an error that says, the name must not be blank, and the age must be greater than zero. So we get we get a um, validation built into the framework that's just validating my logic, right? And this is using um, uh, Micronaut's uh, interceptor logic. And you, you see, this is what I was talking about, where you know typical frameworks that are based on runtime proxies and runtime generated bytecode and runtime everything have like huge stack traces, right? Because you have all the reflection stack traces, then you have all of the runtime generate proxy stack traces, and then you have like, uh, it's, you know, frameworks like Spring can be notorious for the size of their stack traces. But here, you know, the distance between the code in my test and the actual thing being invoked um, is not very big, right? The, the interceptor in comparison, right? So a few stack frames. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, the that that is validation. Uh, validation you can add validation to any of your your components in your application. You can using the annotation model for uh, Java Excel validation. We will move to Jakarta for Micronaut four. And uh, advice is applied. Your validation rules are ensured, and the world is a happy place. Right. Uh, so there are lots of different built-in. Advice types in Micronaut. Um, I don't know what happened to that slide, but there's a circuit breaker, there's at cacheable, there's transactional, there's async, and all of these um, are essentially uh, built in advice types, right? Um, that you can apply to your application and you can implement your own. So let's talk about Micronaut runtimes now. So you haven't seen it, but underneath the service, underneath the surface, when you create a, a, a Mac, Micronaut application, the default server is based on Netty. And I've been using the default, what we call the default runtime, right? But Micronaut can be used to implement many different use cases, right? You can, you can use uh, Micronaut Kafka to create headless microservices that, only, that don't even expose a port, and they just listen for um, you know, streaming data and run some processing, a message, what, what is called message-driven microservices, right? There's no exposed port. The messaging system is driving the logic of the microservice. Um, you can reuse Micronaut to write command line applications. So uh, uh, with Micronaut Pico CLI integration, um, you can write GRP servers and clients in Micronaut where you're using GRPC. Um, and there's no, you know, I think gRPC still uses Netty under the hood, but basically it's, uh, you know, a different runtime. Uh, you can write GraphQL servers in Micronaut. Uh, you can write, we have integration with ser the servlet uh, uh, API, so you can run Micronaut on Tomcat if you wanted to. Uh, we have um, even integration with other frameworks. So, you know, we have a very active, uh, Kotlin community in Micronaut, and you know there is Ktor integration, so that you can uh, you can run you can use Micronaut for dependency injection, but carry on using Ktor uh, as your kind of framework, right? Uh, HTTP layer framework. You can run Micronaut on AWS, AWS Lambda, right? Uh, you can run Micronaut on Oracle Function. You can run Micronaut 
in many different scenarios, right? It's very flexible. But the default server, like I said, is Netty based, which is Netty is a uh, asynchronous, non-blocking I/O focused uh, toolkit. Um, that doesn't mean you can't run blocking op operations on it. You can, and Micronaut fully supports that. So you can run imperative logic, JDBC, JPA, uh, etc. But it also supports fully react reactive applications with a number of different reactive frameworks. So you can choose Reactor. You can you can use RxJava two, RxJava three, and uh, it basically defaults to JSON serialization and deserialization with using either Jackson or Micronaut serialization. Um, uh, and um, let's have a look at a quick demo. So I was already like halfway through building a, a, a demo where we had this controller and it was annotated with at controller. Um, but basically you can um, annotate methods with at get and you know, nest them underneath here. So you could make this like pets.uri slash all if you wanted to, and uh, or just like map to the uri. And this, I basically, I'm going to return a list of pet, which is, you know, these record types. And what's gonna happen is this is by default just going to be uh, assumed that we're going to be serializing this to JSON, right? Now, Micronaut does support uh, view technologies. So there's a module called Micronaut Views. If you want to do typical MVC style applications where uh, you have a view, and you know we support things like Thymeleaf, and we support uh, uh, um, other. You know, my personal favorite right now is JTE because it works really well with Micronaut. If you want to define HTML views on the server, uh, the JTE is nice because it it lets you write views that are compiled into reflection-free Java classes that work perfectly on native image, um, uh, while some other ones, you know, require additional configuration. Uh, but, you know, but the default is to expose uh, JSON. And uh, so how, do, how would I test this if I was writing an, an application? So this is where we get to try out the uh, Micronaut client. So the Micronaut client, um, you define a pet client here, and you can, spe if you specify your URI, it'll assume it's the current default server, and then you can define a get, a, me a method that's gonna make a get request, and this is going to get my list of pets, like so, and then you can inject this into, uh, into my test, and now I have a full end-to-end -end integration test that is gonna make a remote call to my server, serialize the data back to a set of results, uh, which I can assert you know, the, the size of, right? Like so. So um, that is as simple as it gets, right? And it executes extremely quickly. Um, you know, the test execution is really fast. Even though I'm spinning up the entire server, creating an HTTP client, making a remote call, coming back, et cetera, et cetera, it's really fast, right? Uh, if you wanted to debug uh, your HTTP invocations, you can come into your logback configuration and enable io.micronaut.http.client logging and set that level to trace, for example, to trace logging, like so. And if I were to run my test again, uh, you will see that it'll trace the HTTP call back and forth from the client, and you can see down there the, um, the JSON coming, coming back from the response and the, and the HTTP headers and, and everything going back and forth, right? Uh, so, uh, that, you know, my, with Micronaut, uh, you basically have a set of HTTP annotations. So, th in this case, I'm doing a GET request. But, you know, there's a whole package in here with, like, POST and PUT and whatever and, you know, all the different things. You can map your URI variables. And this is where <laughs> uh, the framework really, you know, starts to shine when it comes to compilation-based approaches. You know, so, for example, if I added an endpoint some point here 
where you know and for the moment I'm just going to return you know find my name and just return an empty optional here uh, import just return nothing for the moment uh, when you return an empty optional by default what happens is it will return a 404 error and uh, there is a default uh, JSON representation of, of the 404, which you can customize to your own error format. We also support problem JSON and um, uh, a few other you know, standards for error formats if you, if you want. Uh, in this case, I'm just you know, returning empty because I want to demonstrate this. But basically, here I'm defining an endpoint where uh, the, it maps to a particular URI, and the URI is provided by user input, right? So I can say pets slash Dino. So like in a traditional framework, this would be um, a, uh, if I did something wrong here, like, because this basically binds to this variable, right? But, you know, if you, um, if, if I got to put a typer in there or something like that, you get like active compilation time checking at the framework level, right? And this is really powerful because you get compilation errors not just for you know, uh, not just for uh, your usage of your Java code, but also your usage of framework-related code, right? So this, this says the route declares a URI variable name called name, but no corresponding method argument is present. So I don't know how to, Micronaut doesn't know how to like deal with this, right? Doesn't know. So, you know, most frameworks in this case, it would be a runtime exception, you know, and then you would have to figure out look at the stack trace, like what's going on, you know, and you have a, a worse experience, right? Uh, with Rikonaut, you have active compilation time checking in the, when you're, even when you're defining your HTTP endpoints or when you're interacting with the framework, which is really, really, really powerful, right? Um, and you have this, you know, really easy to wait. So like by default here, um, what happens is, uh, it's going to run each of these methods uh, just in the Netty event loop. So Netty is an event loop model where uh, it'll it'll execute these. So ideally, you don't want to block, but if you are running block, blocking, blocking logic, uh, it's perfectly acceptable, and you 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 know you you can write block, blocking logic. What you want to do is you want to say execute on task ex uh, task schedulers io. And I will execute, and you can put this on the method level, and it will schedule these operations on the I/O throughput, and it won't block the event loop. Uh, you can also, if your application is entirely using blocking operations, um, uh, and you you want to do that globally, you can come in here, and you can say micronaut dot server dot server dot thread selection I/O, and it will configure micronaut server to always allocate workers onto the IO thread loop and then you can do whatever blocking operations and you're not blocking the netty event loop thread. Um, so, uh, you know, but again, depending what micronaut runtime you're using, this may or not, may not be a, a consideration for you. Uh, in this case, uh, in this case, that's how you would do it, right? Uh, but the key thing is that if you are doing fully non-blocking and reactive, you can uh, you run the entire operation on the event loop and uh, and you know never block and keep the number of threads very low, memory consumption very low, and basically scale uh, in terms of um, uh, connections and so forth. Um, okay, so uh, you can also spin the, the server up like manually, like if you have programmatic use cases, <coughs> you can call application context that run and tell it to give me the embedded server, and it will start the micronaut context and it will return an embedded server instance, which you can use to get hold of the port. This is actually how we used to support uh, unit testing. So you used to call run, and it would spin up the, um, the server, and you get the server, then you get the port, and then you would call the client um, b before we had micronode test, right? Um, you have, um, you use annotations in the mio.micronode.http.annotation package, but we also support uh, JAXRS annotations, so we have a module that translates JAXRS annotations if you prefer that. We have a module that supports Spring annotations. If you prefer the Spring ones, ultimately they, they get transformed into the same thing. I already demoed the HTTP client, but so we'll just talk about it. It's a Netty-based HTTP client. Um, 
uh, we have both a low-level interface and also the declarative HTTP client. And it also supports um, uh, you know, reactive, completable feature. So like, for example, if I go over here and I go over to my client over here um, and I say, you know, I want to use a, um, well, let's just use a completable feature, for example. Um, then, you know, I can do things like, um, um, what is the method to get? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, good point. Somebody's back. So then I can say get, you know, and you can supply a timeout here or whatever. And this, this call becomes, uh, you know, asynchronous, essentially. Um, so um, uh, that's, you know, that's the, uh, how you would, but we also support, you know, if you add Reactor, and I'll, I'll do more of that in the future, but if you add Reactor, you can put a mono here, and if you made a call from one microservice to another, you can have mono declared here, and do, you know, fully reactive end-to-end -end, uh, programming through with Micronauts client and HTTP. Uh, support. Uh, we also have support for uh, service discovery. So right now, this is starting with URI, um, you know, pets. Uh, but you can actually, instead of like hard coding a URI here that I want to point to, and I'm just going to go back uh, to my original blocking implementation for the moment. Uh, what you can do is you can have you can assign this an ID and this is, and say this is this uses. Um, the service ID called pets, right? And if I were to run this, uh, it will fail, I imagine, because it'll say no available services for ID pet, uh, which is expected because it doesn't know how to talk to the server with just that ID. ID. Uh, so you can come in here and you can say services. Um, like this, and you say pet, and you say URL, and this is going to talk to some local server, or whatever, and that'll define that the ID pet is bound to that URL, right? And now, um, what's important here is that, you know, obviously you would never do this in production. This is for like for testing, but the important thing here is that. The URL is decoupled from the client, right? So, so if you're running on Kubernetes, for example, if you use the Micronaut Kubernetes module, you can specify an ID or ID that ref refers to a Kubernetes service, right? And if you're using Micronaut Kubernetes, uh, Micronaut's HTTP client will discover all the Kubernetes services named pets and will uh, automatically discover where you know from the Kubernetes API uh, how to make the invocation right, and use client side load balancing, or if you're using or or if using a uh, discovery, a service discovery infrastructure component such as console for example, if you're using HashiCorp console to to do service discovery, you can say find me all the you know the 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 the, the console services named pets. And then you know it'll it'll find you all the URLs and it will do client side load balancing between them and it will keep the list up to date automatically by checking periodically in the console you know is my list of services correct or you know basically discovering where you have to make invocations because the last thing what you want to do is like directly couple your um, your configuration you know directly put in here HTTP localhost uh, you know that's not good for production right. <laughs> I can't push to production and have hard-coded uh, destinations for my client, right? If I'm in a microservice environment, I need to be able to to, cu to customize those. And the way you do that is through ID, I, I, uh, service IDs that you can configure or discover using service discovery. And Micronaut has built-in service discovery that supports Kubernetes, it supports console, it supports Eureka, it supports you know, many different ways. Uh, it supports, you know, all sorts of different ways where you can discover how to make this invocation, right? Um, so built-in service discovery support is, is, is critical to the HTTP client. And obviously, this is the decorative HTTP client, but there is also a, um, uh, you know, a low-level client, which is just called HTTP client. 
which you can inject. And you can actually customize the injection point in that case. So I can say ID equals pets, and it will inject uh, me a client that targets the pet service, right? Um, using a qualifier. That, I had a question coming up earlier from you know somebody that said, does Micronauts support qualifiers uh, in the dependency injection? And something I didn't raise was yes, Micronauts supports uh, qualifiers. So you know if you have uh, your pet repository here, and this one, like, this guy was called at named uh, what I don't know one or something. And then you had another one that was also, and they implemented some common interface. You can use the the name qualifier to inject different implementations. Just diverging there. Uh, so the client um, is a critical part of Micronaut in terms of if you're using it in the microservices space. Uh, again, it uses the same annotations as the server to define how you make your client invocations. Another critical thing about microservices and in general is observability. So Micronaut has a management module and the management module exposes a number of management endpoints um, at a, on a port that you specify and by default they're locked down and secured. Uh, you actually have to use Micronaut security or something to, to, you know, to basically to, to, to expose um, a role that can actually access all of the, the data. By default, the health endpoint will just tell you I'm up or I'm down. I'm, di I'm down. But if you authenticate, it will give you a lot more default detail on why why the service is down. Right. Um, everything else is pretty much locked down, like metrics. In bit. It's all secured by default. Um, but typically, you run the run these on a different port. And uh, and it provides the app the ability to provide to obtain insight into your application. So metrics, health, information, what's the configured environment. There's a refresh endpoint that you can invoke to like re reload everything. You can see the active routes. Um, in addition with Micronaut uh, and observability, uh, we support, uh, Micronaut supports things like uh, Zipkin and Jaeger and OpenTelemetry for tr distributed tracing. Um, and that's all built in to, to Micronaut. So you have you know, tracing support uh, is a whole mo whole module. You can use Zipkin directly. You can use it through OpenTelemetry. Uh, metrics are provided through Macrometer, and we have integration with all the different metrics backends uh, in, in the cloud or, or or systems like Prometheus and, and so forth. Um, in addition, Micronaut it ha has a, a number of abstractions that promote cloud portability and uh, implementations of those abstractions for different clouds. Uh, so there is, um, uh, you know, we, 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 you often in the, in the cloud environment want to retrieve secrets, you want to re retrieve distributed configuration, you want to interact with object storage, you want to, impl you want to implement uh, functions, you want to send pub-sub messaging. Um, and all of these uh, integrations live in specific uh, sub-projects Many of which have received numerous contributions from uh, the cloud vendors themselves. So, for example, Google, Google contributes to our Google Cloud GCP module. The AWS folks have contributed to the Amazon module. Uh, the Oracle Cloud is developed um, at Oracle Labs, all the integrations. So, it's a collaborative effort to make Micronaut cloud native and portable. Um, and we have guides and tutorials and all sorts of things. So, making your applications portable across clouds. And in fact, I have a talk on Wednesday, uh, shameless self-promotion. <laughs> if, if you want to hear more Micronaut, on Wednesday I have a talk on building cloud portable applications in the cloud um, uh, using Micronaut. So, so do come to that uh, if you want even more detail. OK, so now I'm going to talk about serialization. So, so Micronaut serialization is a build time replacement for Jackson. In fact, it's going to be the default serialization mechanism for Micronaut. And it's a great example of what we were talking about, of using those building blocks to reduce the runtime weight. Right. So it supports like 80, 90% of the available Jackson annotation model. or It also supports JSONB annotations. Um, but it, it reduces the memory footprint significantly, and it's significantly more uh, secure um, 
because it doesn't allow arbitrary serialization and deserialization of objects. It's also automatically compatible with native image. And in terms of the footprint, you know, if you look at something like Jackson DataBind, it's like a 2.4 megabyte jar file, right? It's massive, you know, uh, 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 serialization and deserialization of Java objects, 2.4 megabyte. And that's an example of how much runtime weight uh, is needed to perform that task for all the different possible use cases that Jackson supports, right? Micronaut serialization, on the other hand, is 300 kilobyte. And that has, that 300 kilobyte has, translates to your native image executable size. You know, the, the, Using Micronaut serialization, for example, with GraalVM native image results in a five megabyte reduction in the image sizes that you build because the Jackson is not there in the image. Right? Um, because Micronaut doesn't have that runtime weight because you know, Jackson has to do all sorts of things, or many of the things Spring has to do to support all the different, different runtime analysis it has to do um, to support uh, re reflective usage at runtime, right? It has to analyze your types, your classes, has to support records, has to do this, has to, you know, it's very, very complex and heavy component at runtime. Uh, Micronaut serialization, on the other hand, is, is much simpler, right? So, um, uh, let's see, so, what I'm gonna do is to demonstrate Micronaut serialization is I'm gonna go jump into uh, the terminal here and one of the features I, I, I like of you know, the command line, but it's also available in, um, in the UI. So if you come in here and you ask for serial, uh, serialization Jackson, for example, uh, and you click the diff button, it'll tell you what you need to do to add, uh, to make the changes to your project to, to add a particular Micronaut feature to it. So it shows you a diff, which is quite nice. And the, and the thing is, it's also available on the command line if you s install the Micronaut command line. So you can say, feature diff features serialization Jackson, uh, for example. Uh, and you could drop into interactive mode, uh, which you just type MN if you, if you don't want to memorize everything. But it'll show you the diff of what you need to that. that. And basically, the key to it, the main key to it is a, uh, in, at least for Gradle, and obviously the difference with, uh, if you it would depend whether you're using Maven, but basically in Gradle you add an annotation processor and you add a uh, implementation. Now uh, you might be questioning, uh, and you remove data, Jackson data bind, and you add. You might be questioning why there's a serialization implementation that relies on Jackson. So we still, you have to choose a parsing and uh, a, a parser and a generator to to pair Micronaut serialization with. Um, so uh, it doesn't depend on data bind, but it optionally depends on Jackson for parsing and for pa actual, the actual parsing of the, which is a very small library, the Jackson parser in isolation. You can also swap that out for JSONP if you prefer to not have any Jackson dependencies in your app whatsoever. But data bind is eliminated from the class part and it's just using the parsing component from Jackson, not the whole data bind infrastructure, which is like, uh, the parser itself is like 100 kilobytes or something. So um, with that, uh, if I were to run this test now, um, I imagine it would fail. Let's, let's, let's see. And it does, uh, because I'm still using service IDs. Let's just change that back to just you know, talk to my pets URI again directly or my current server. And let's see what happens. So uh, it fails. Um, and it fails because uh, basically an unexpected error occurred because um, basically I'm not allowed to serialize, serialize the type pet, right? Uh, so this is a key difference with Jackson is it doesn't allow you to arbitrarily serialize any object you actually have to de declare something as either serializable or deserializable before it's allowed. And this, this is by design, right? So you can add at servable to a type and that, that's, that essentially uh, says that it's both serializable and deserializable. Or you can add just serializable and then it's serializable but not deserializable, right? 
Um, so you can control whether something is serializable or deserializable or not, and you have to explicitly declare which ones are. Uh, beyond that, you can use normal uh, uh, Jackson annotations, like I, I can say, you know, JSON property, you know, whatever. Uh, oops. Uh, you know, to customize how the, the how everything is actually serialized. Uh, but at runtime, Jackson data bind is not actually used at all, right? And um, when I run this now, it's uh, instead of using uh, uh, Jackson data bind, it's using Micronaut serialization. So it's really that simple, right? Um, and then uh, now you may not be in charge of the classes that you have want to serialize and deserializable deserialize with Micronaut serialization. So what we have is the ability to actually import classes. So you can say said import um, serializable pet.class, for example, if it's a class that is already compiled on the class path, um, to import existing types and make them serializable, right? But by default, it's locked down. And this is actually a, an important feature because you know many, uh, many uh, vulnerabilities uh, with Jackson in applications have been because you know, Jackson essentially allows arbitrary serialization and deserialization of anything, right? So if if you're working on a project and you know one of your coders uh, adds a member a new field, and that that class has reference to a type called admin, or you know, and with all your administrative privileges, and then you serialize it, and it recursively goes off and serializes admin, you have a security vulnerability, right? Uh, you have to be very careful with Jackson not to accidentally serialize too much information. Uh, and developers often don't like think about this, right? So we made a conscious design choice in Micronaut to say, actually, you need to think about what you allow to be serialized, right? And that's, that's uh, but you know, if you want to continue to use Jackson, Micronaut supports Jackson, you know, that's, you know, it will, will support Jackson. But we do recommend you have a look at uh, Micronaut serialization because it's, uh, it's uh, smaller, more efficient, uh, consumes less memory, reflection-free, works with um, native image out of the box. And it all, primarily, it's just a matter of adding like, a single annotation, and you're, you're done, right? Um, so you annotate which types you want to serialize and deserialize. You specify, you use an API that you choose. You can use the Jackson annotations, which aren't interpreted at runtime, or you can use the JSONB ones. You use a runtime parser you prefer. You can use JSONP, or you can use the Jackson low-level parser without data bind in place. And, and that's it, right? So now let's look, move on to uh, building native images. So uh, with, with Micronaut, we have worked extensively with um, the ecosystem to build a set of official uh, plugins for uh, for Gradle and Maven, and uh, those are those official native image uh, Gradle and and Maven plugins are integrated into uh, the framework when you create an application. So if you're using Gradle, it's just a matter of Gradle of your native compile, uh, we which will compile a native image. Uh, we also worked expense extensively with the. Uh, Spring team and the JUnit 5 team to allow native testing. So you can compile your JUnit 5 tests into a native image and run them as well if you're using uh, JUnit 5. And we also integrate with things like Docker, right? So you can build native images um, in Docker, push native images to Docker container registries, and it works whether you're using Maven or Gradle, right? Uh, so the way this works is, uh, and the IDE actually has, uh, so you actually go into the IDE and you can say build native image and it will build you the native image uh, if you prefer going through the IDE. Uh, but from terminal, uh, basically you can say Gradle W native compile. And before I do that, let me show you how you, you build the you know, traditional Java version, right? So you run Gradle assemble and it will build a runnable jar file, right? And I can do J Java jar uh, build libs, and I can run my application, right? 
there it is. So it starts up in 754 milliseconds, something like that. Uh, I can come in here, open another terminal window, and say HTTP uh, pets. And um, it, I don't know why that went, Python taking a long time. So, um, and it will send a request to my application, and I get the data back, and, and that's it, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that is uh, how you run like the, the kind of runnable JIT version, right? Um, and as you can see, if we go to uh, the activity monitor Java, we find the, the Java process, uh, you know, it's, it's basically this guy, it's using like 70 megabyte of memory or something like that, right? So. Pretty low for Java. I mean, Micronaut is pretty pretty efficient, um, but uh, but yeah, uh, uh, for native image, uh, what you can do is you can say Gradle W native compile, right? And this will compile the application into a self-contained native executable. Now, the, the actual it's going to perform the full you know closed world static analysis of the uh, entire application. So what does that mean? So what it, what it means is it's going to go and find all of the reachable part of the application uh, in in the application, and uh, and the, the parts that are not reachable, it's actually going to eliminate them from the image altogether. Um, so uh, so this this has implications of how you think about your application design because you you can actually, for example, use at requires and say. You know, I, this this type is only required if some other type is on the class path, and then if native image gets to that, when you combine it with micro micro AOT, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, it'll actually lim eliminate that type or that class from uh, the the class path altogether. And you know, it's going through essentially doing the analysis, um, checking for all the reachable methods, and 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 you know taking the, the configuration that you provide as input and any kind of, you might, might have seen at the beginning that we have some you know, features uh, that are included uh, for things like that. Um, I think I actually didn't remove direct from data bind from my class path, so it's actually, but anyway, uh, it's, it's essentially building the native image, right? And this will result in an image, a native executable that is specific to the machine I'm running on. So what does that mean? So that means that It'll be built for this architecture. It will only run on this Mac or another Mac, right? Another Mac. But I, can't, I couldn't take this image and run it on a Linux machine or, um, or a Windows machine, right? Uh, so whatever you, when you run native comp compile, you must remember that the, the image that you build is targeting the environment. Now, if you have Docker installed, uh, if you have doc Docker, you can run Gradle W Docker build native. And that will uh, build a, you know, using a Docker container. Uh, you, you can, for example, on this Mac, this is an Intel Mac, you can build a, a container that runs on a, in a Linux container. Um, but, uh, you know, what I've built is essentially the, the native version of the, um, whoops, okay, so for that pop up, I don't know why it pops up, so anyway, so basically, uh, you can see that the startup time is dramatically improved, right? Uh, orders of magnitude faster, and um, and and you know it's essentially the same application as before. You know, uh, I can send the the request, but this this time it's you know running native image responded a hell of a lot faster than if that's uh, native image as well, or, or just Python taking a while. So. Uh, so yeah, and if we look at the memory consumption, in this case we have to look at the process. You can see that the memory consumption there is, you know, 18 megabytes. There's a more accurate ways to measure the memory consumption using command line commands or whatever else. But I know, but basically, you know, significantly more efficient the combination, and significantly, you know, the startup time is phenomenal, right? Low millisecond numbers we're talking about here, and that has direct implications for. Um, uh, you know, serverless, uh, serverless environments, even for com command line applications, right, where you want them to quickly start up. Now, what I haven't demonstrated is Micronaut AOT. So, um, you know, the the 
uh, also on Linux, uh, startup time is faster than on the Mac. Um, you know, benchmarking, but basically these are conservative numbers. Um, but basically, you're looking. You know, there's various ways to achieve more startup time. You, you know, JDK 17 and just running the app. You you know, you get uh, you get like 650 hundreds of milliseconds of startup time. You can use CDS app CDS to maybe shave that a, a little bit off. But really, if you want the state of the art of like ultimate startup time uh, performance and memory consumption like native image uh, is the way to do that. And we have another project uh, which uh, you can add to your build. Um, and basically, uh, you go to your build the Gradle and you add Micronaut AOT to it. And what Micronaut AOT does, if you rebuild the native image, is, is allows you to uh, do additional uh, ahead of time steps that are not um, were not possible uh, using annotation processing. So, for example, it will do things like convert your log back XML to Java code, so that an XML parser is no longer needed, and then the XML parser is no longer reachable. It gets removed from the image. It will convert your YAML configuration that you have in your project uh, into Java code. So a YAML parser is no longer needed, therefore the YAML parser is not reachable, therefore it's eliminated from the image. Um, it'll do things like do a whole application analysis of your class path to figure out beans that cannot be injected in your application because they don't meet the requirements. So it'll narrow the list of beans down so that it'll only be the ones that are you know, viable for that image. And it will, and you know, with all of that, with Micronaut AOT actually drops the startup time on Linux to seven milliseconds, which is phenomenal. And um, or, you know, and and the memory consumption would would you know, I'm sure, be reduced as well because of uh, just less code being there. Now, there are cases where you may want to do reflection, right? Uh, there there may be a case where you want to do reflection, and um, and how do you deal with that case? So so for example, I don't know. Uh, you, ha you want to, for some reason or the other, reflectively access this name, name component of this record component, right? So uh, I don't know why you would want to do this, and Micronaut is not necessary, but there may be some reason. It may be because you're passing it off to some third-party library. It may be, be because you're integrating with something external. Um, but so there's a, f there's a few ways. One way is you can add at reflective access to the type. In which case, Micronaut will generate the reflection configuration for GraalVM native image and uh, for the entire type. Like, so for the type and you know, all of its components. But you can also do go, go more um, fine-grained and say, I want reflective access just for this name field uh, or, you know, of this pet type, but not for the whole type. right? So, uh, so there are ways, you know, to basically allow, you know, specify the reflective information if you uh, need it. Uh, but, um, you know, in general, when you when you're using Micronaut itself uh, and Micronaut's modules and integrations, which are already native image ready, you don't need to. But just remember that that's that's there. Now, another another case may be you're in, you're you're integrating a third party system or a, or a library or something that you need for your project and and um, it, uh, it it uses reflection right so there is there's also a way where you can say, where you can say uh, gradle w run slash p agent and that will activate the tracing agent for native image and it will trace your application uh, you know, you have to like browse around it, and it will generate all the reflective configuration, all the reflective configuration needed to pass the native image. Uh, typically, I would use this as like a one. It's not something you would run continuously. You'd run it once, figure out what you need, and then add the configuration to your resources source uh, main resources directory in the meta inf native image folder. Uh, you put all your config in there, and you, you're done, right? Uh, but the native image agent can help you diagnose, uh, you know, basically discover uh, what, what reflection configuration is required. 
to get your application working, right? Um, so that's how you deal with uh, reflection information. And like I said, Micronaut AOT is an additional um, module, an additional component of Micronaut that allows you to deal with uh, additional closed world optimizations, um, removing unused beans. It also has the ability to cache the environment. So, you know, Micronaut, I told you before that in general, dependency injection is wired together at runtime. But, and the environment is mutable. That means that you can supply different configuration values and move your application from one container to another or one environment for another to another, and it will rewire the application for that environment. Micronaut AOT lets you, uh, lets you create a, a mutable configuration where the configuration is computed whilst the image is being built and sealed so your... your, so your um, so you would want to integrate that optional part of Micronaut AOT into kind of some kind of DevOps pipeline where you supply the production configuration as part of your build, and then it does all the evaluation ahead of time of the configuration and seals it, and it's immutable, and that leads to less lookups of configuration. We know the configuration can't change, so we don't have to monitor for changes with a background thread. Um, you know, so it, 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 you can cache the environment, essentially. So there's lots of options that micro AOT adds in addition to make it slimmer, smaller, um, more efficient, right? In addition to Micronaut AOT, a cool module of Micronaut is Micronaut Open API. So this one, again, if you do MN feature diff features uh, swagger UI, uh, basically, what you can do is add a few uh, modules to a couple of annotations, an annotation processor, um, and a, the Swagger API annotations uh, to your uh, application like that. And uh, you can add some configuration to your uh, application.yaml here uh, under the the router, there we go. Uh, get rid of those plus. There we go. Okay, so, uh, and then um, what you can do is um, run the application. And actually, I'm going to demonstrate another cool feature of, and this works with Maven as well. If you do Maven MN run, MN run, it will re automatically restart your server. But if you do Gradle W runs and append hyphen T, which activates continuous mode, um, the server starts up. And uh, if I go to uh, my browser here, open a new tab, I go to localhost 8080, swagger UI. Is that not right? Um, um, why is that not resolving? Am I typing it in wrong? Swagger UI? Okay, well, leave it for the moment. What I'll do is just show you the output um, YAML for the moment. I obviously got some config wrong in here, but I can't see right now. So. Basically, what it'll do is it will build uh, from your application sources. And this is where you can see Micronaut, uh, Micronaut's compilation time processing being really beneficial because Swagger, um, you know, uh, you basically have a, uh, you know, is a, is a format where you describe your API in terms of like operations and definitions. As you can see, it, uh, just by adding that module to my path, at compilation time, it's producing a static swagger.yaml file from my application source code. And why is this, you know, why is this cool? Because like most frameworks like that have this kind of feature, um, basically do runtime evaluation and trying to work out everything at runtime and like build this document. But why can't we just do it at build time, right? Why can't we just like figure out during compilation time? And the other thing that's cool about it is if we come into, um, you know, so here is my list method, right? Or here is my find method, right? So if I do come in here, and I say use javadoc, um, list the available pets, 
return a list of beds, right? And I compile, uh, and I go back to my generated uh, Swagger. You can see that uh, my Java doc comments are starting to uh, appear in my generated configuration, right? So I can I can document my Java code as if it was you know my API. Uh, you know, find a pet by name, the name of the pet, the, the pet or nothing if it doesn't exist, etc. Save. And uh, incrementally, my, the application is restarting and rebuilding my, my Swagger definition based on my Java talk comments. And this can only be done if you're processing the source code, like we're doing in Micronaut, right? We can build from the source code because we can see the cool thing about annotation processing is you can see the Java doc comments, right? You can say, hey, these, these are the comments for my API, and I'm going to build that, uh, a compilation time, my Swagger definition, and, and render it to a, a Swagger UI, if I could figure out what my configuration was wrong. Um, but yeah, so Micronaut's open API integration is also really cool, right? So uh, you, can, uh, you can basically um, just add an annotation processor, process your source code, build Swagger UI, we don't have to process anything at runtime, it's just a static file, and it uses all of Micronaut's compilation time APIs. Okay, so now we're gonna look at Micronaut data in the last part of the presentation. So, uh, Micronaut data is a bit of a, a passion project for me because I was involved in, in um, uh, a lot of data access implementations. So when we built Grails, uh, we were like, we looked at Ruby on Rails and we, th we saw how like in Ruby on Rails you have this active record thing which is really cool. You could like define a book and you could say book find by title. So we were like, how do we bring this to, J how do we bring this to Java? And, we, and you know, I saw the Groovy language and we were like, hey, let's basically layer on top of Hibernate the same thing. So you can do book find by title. And uh, GORM was born, right? And GORM, amazing technology. You, know, you can basically define a, uh, a book and maps to a table and you get all the queries automatically. But, um, uh, and it was like the first one on the JVM to do that. And then uh, I was involved at the beginning of Spring Data. Uh, you know, I started working for uh, Spring Source, VMware, and they were like, yeah, we, we love GORM, but it's in Groovy. You know, we want the same thing in Java. Uh, and you know, we started Spring Data. So you know, those, those are like the precursors precursors, successes to, to Micronaut data, essentially. And uh, they, they both use an, an approach, which is to, at runtime, try and figure out what the query is, right? So the way they work is they intercept a method call, right? So you have find by title or something. They intercept that method call. They evaluate at runtime. OK, I'm targeting a SQL database. OK, you're trying to return a, a person. Um, and they compute the SQL or the JPA QL query, and then it's like a one-off computation, and then they cache it in memory, and that's it, right? And, uh, um, and these, uh, they, they heavily rely on reflection and runtime proxies, and, and the, the, the first query takes a little bit longer and then, until it warms up, and you have to warm up all these queries, um, because you, know, you, bas you, you basically have to do all this computation. It's, all of it is left to runtime. Micronaut data was like an opportunity to look at this you know, what can we do with compilers? Uh, can't we just like compute this ahead of time? So uh, with Micronaut Data, it pre-computes everything uh, during compilation. And it uses, uh, it, if you're using Hibernate, then of course it uses reflection. Um, but if you're using Micronaut Data JDBC or R2DBC or our MongoDB implementation, it's using the introspection stuff I showed earlier. And, um, for the AP layer, it's like completely reflection free and it's like zero overhead, right? We have benchmarks like where we like test direct method invocation uh, versus like Micronaut data and it's like barely, you know, because the bottleneck is the database, there's like, whilst other data access solutions tend to add a bit of overhead, right? And in addition, in addition we have compilation time checking, which is awesome, um, and like, and smaller stack, stack traces. Now, there, there are lots of different implementations of Micronaut data, 
And um, depending on your requirements, we have support for JPA, we have support for JDBC, which is JDBC is clearly a blocking API. We have support for RTDBC if you want to do full end-to-end -end reactive applications. We have support for MongoDB now. And the MongoDB implementation is interesting because it's using Micronaut serialization under the covers. So it's actually using Micronaut serialization on top of the BSON uh, encoder and decoder directly at the driver level to encode and decoder objects uh, reflection-free to and from MongoDB. Um, and, uh, and with Mo the MongoDB implementation as well, you can uh, nowadays even point it to uh, Oracle Autonomous Database in Oracle Cloud and you get a MongoDB API, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, and we have other teams at Oracle that have embraced it as well. There's Micronaut, Micronaut Data for Oracle Coherence. Uh, so if you, Oracle Coherence is a distributed data grid solution, and you can use Micronaut data on top of that. And in the latest release of Micronaut, which just came out, the 3.7, we implemented support for test containers and test resources. And this is, this is, very, this is a very cool project because, uh, you know, um, basically, you want, uh, you want, you, when, when you want to test your database, you know, your inter interactions with the database, you, you know, historically what's be, what happened in the Java community is people have used H2. H2 who's used H2, data, H2 database? Like loads of people, right? You write, use H2 database, which is an in-memory database for your tests. And then in production, you go, you, you run the same application with your production database, which is, but the problem is, is H2 is not the same as, as MySQL or Oracle database. Like the actual dialect it supports is a different variation of SQL. Uh, so you're not actually testing the real database that you actually are gonna use in production. You're kind of mocking the database, which is not ideal, right? If you're actually trying to write real integration tests because you're not testing the real behavior of your real database. And this is where test containers is, a cool solution because you can spin up your database in a container and you can run your integration tests against uh, the, the container. Now, in order to integrate test containers into a framework, uh, it is useful to have some kind of integration at the framework level because it makes it like, just easier to use. And that's what we built. We built Gradle and Maven plugins. And they're cool because they spin up the test containers um, process in a separate server that's actually written in Micronaut itself. And why would, so most people when they use test containers, they include the test containers uh, integration on their test class path, right? And then they, uh, they reference directly the test containers API. But uh, our solution actually lets you run, for example, you can do Gradle native test and you can run your native tests um, against test containers, test containers are running in a separate process and your, your, your application will be compiled into a native image and your native application runs against, uh, your native image built application runs against your test because we have the separation where um, test containers is not included in your actual application class path. Um, and it also allows for reuse and I'll show you that all in a minute. But basically, um, uh, let's, let's see how that all works together. So what I'm going to do, <coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to drop into terminal again, and I'm going to do mn feature diff, um, and we're going to say features data JDBC, and features we're going to we'll use MySQL today for fun. Right. So in order to add Micronaut data uh, JDBC, you can see that we're going to get test resources. So we, we come in and we go into our builder gradle and we include the, the test resources module. Uh, we need an annotation processor for um, Micronaut data. So there's an additional annotation processor module that plugs in to provide all the, the querying at compile time. We, we get a, a dependency on, um, on uh, Micronaut data itself, in this case JDBC with a connection pooling implementation. Uh, we get our uh, uh, MySQL driver, right? Which we can add. And uh, we get some configuration for the data source. Now, uh, we definitely don't encourage uh, 
hard coding usernames and passwords into your configuration. That's definitely not something you want to want to do. So you'll notice that the configuration doesn't include like the database URL or the username and the password, and that's by design, right? Because you don't want to include those in, in because those are like secure, potentially leaky information. You want to provide those from your Vault uh, encryption service or or your your externally to the environment, right? Um, okay, so. I have the fact that I'm using the driver uh, and so on and so forth. So what you can do now is you can drop into uh, the terminal again. Um, and actually, let's define some entities. So first of all, uh, with micro.data, <coughs> what you can do is uh, define entities that map to database tables. So in this case, we've got a pet. And what we can do is you can uh, make it a uh, mapped entity. So, so if I can... I just add the mapped entity annotation here. There you go, and that says that's mapped to the database. Now, if I was using JPA, this would be at entity, but I don't have JPA on the class path. We also support the JPA annotations if you prefer those. Um, the only difference, main difference uh, that you want is typically you have an ID that represents the database ID, so that would be like a generated value that is the database ID that is nullable, for example. Um, you can feed in null by default, you know, to basically um, allow it to be persisted. So uh, in this demo, I just must, must point out that I'm using Micronaut Data JDBC, and I really like Micronaut Data JDBC because one, it lets me use records, right? I can use records to read and write objects to the database. And it's using, uh, you know, just, uh, um, just pure JDBC calls. And it's a simple data mapper, right? There's no, there's no lazy loading, there's no session, there's no proxying, there's no, like, all of the features of Hibernate are not, are not there. And some people like those features, and that's fine. So if you want to use Hibernate, you can also use, we have, you know, great tutorials on using Hibernate and JPA and, and that kind of thing. Um, so what I've done is I've defined a pet entity um, that, uh, that models my, my database table, you know, with an ID, a name, an age, and a type. You, you can define multiple entities. So, um, uh, so for example, you know, that, that have, a, have associations between each other. Uh, so, you know, I can have an owner here. Um, that, yeah is also a uh, mapped ent entity. Um, oops, no way. That happened there. Okay, anyway. And, you know, it might have a, a long ID as well and a name, uh, you know, to, to basically model um, uh, the, the uh, a, a, a type that maps to an owner table, right? And it might have an ID, and that might be nullable, right? And maybe we import that. And you can have secondary constructors as well here. Uh, I think you can even generate those with this. So uh, generate constructor. Well, not quite. Almost. Okay, so there we go. There's my... And then you can have, for example, an owner has many pets or whatever, or many to one. For example, we could define uh, each pet has an owner, like so. And this is a many to one, uh, sorry, a re relation that is of type many to one, right? Um, and uh, we can define the owner type as being required in the constructor here. And now I have some types that map to the database. So uh, that was pretty simple. I have a pet, I have an owner. So uh, now, um, how do we implement repository logic? So with Micronaut Data, it's very similar to Spring Data, Spring Data and GORM. And historically, you basically define an interface. Uh, instead of using at singleton, we say that this is mapped with JDBC repository, and this is a dialect. Um, of MySQL, and it extends from a parent interface called CRUD repository, which defines a uh, pet and a uh, entity of type pet with an ID of type long. Um, we can then get rid of all of this because we don't need it because it will be implemented for me. Although you can override things. So, for example, you can say, 
I want to override functionality from the parent interface. So I can say, you know, I don't know if I want to, if I want to override find all, for example, um, and I can override and make it return using covariant return type in Java, basically return a list instead of an iterable. So you can override the methods that the CRUD repository parent interface provides you, which allows you to do CRUD, right? Um, so uh, with that, we can come over to my um, pet controller class, and we can say, you know, use some database access instead. And uh, we can come and implement my logic here for my find endpoint where we were saying, uh, I want to find by name. Now, this is where it gets cool with my data, because basically this is not something that's been implemented, but I can make it implemented for me, right? So I just generate the, say I want that implementation, and I just have to define the interface name that I want, and the actual logic will be implemented for me, right? To do the query, to return the optional of pet if it exists, otherwise return an empty. It all gets implemented automatically for me uh, by Micronaut Data JDBC. Now, what's really cool <coughs> is, you know, this is obviously very simple, but you can say, you know, Micronaut find my name starts with, you know, or and you can, you know chain it so you can say or age or you or you can use like age query so you can say find by find by age greater than and you get completion in the in the um, in the ID. Now now what's cool is how type safe micronaut data is, right? So I'm saying find by age greater than but it's saying it's giving me an error here saying find by age greater than parameter string is not compatible with property int. Right? So my 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 pet type here the age property is an int. Yeah, so I, I actually can't do this. I can't say find by age greater than string. That's an invalid method. But I'm getting a compilation time check here that's checking that the, pr the parameter I've specified is actually valid. And that, that extends to like other things, right? So if I try find by nom uh, or something like that, where I say, you know, it's going to fail to compile. I'm saying, you know, find by nom cannot query pet entity on a non-existent property nom. There's nothing in pet that's called nom. Um, <laughs> therefore, I cannot compile. You know, in traditional frameworks like GORM and Spring Data, this would be a runtime error. You get a big stack trace and you would say, you have to go through the stack trace and try and figure out what the hell is going on here. Yeah? Why is my thing failing? This, <coughs> you get active comp compilation time checking of your data repositories, which is really cool and um, really useful, right? Uh, now, uh, let's let's just implement this this quickly. You know, uh, finish implementing this. So, so I have a repository now, and you can use this. You know, data to basic. You can use this to, you know, write. Uh, you can also use the repository to write data, which I'm going to do. I'm going to make my application class a singleton, and I'm going to inject my owner repository in here. Oh, I don't have an owner repository yet. That's true. I need one of them. So let's have a, another repository called owner repository. Um, there it is. And we're going to make this a JDBC repository that is using MySQL. Um, so on. And it's going to extend from CRUD repository. And um, it's going to be the owner in the long right? So uh, we're going to get hold of my two repository implementations in here. We're going to have an owner repository. And we're going to have my pet repository. And we can generate a constructor to inject those two guys. Then we can really easily like, write an event listener that is trans uh, transactional, that runs when the application starts up. right? So we have a whole event model in Micronaut where you can define event listeners. We have support for our transactional, so the things roll back. And um, using that repository, we can say, for example, a new owner. Let's call him Fred Flintstone. Um, and uh, introduce. So this is where records come into play, right? So I'm calling save. Um, but I'm actually getting hold of the return values. The return value of the owner will return the instance that has the ID assigned. And it will, uh, it will it do the insert, uh, get the database ID, and use a copy constructor to 
return me a copy of the object with the with the ID inserted, so we maintain immutability, right? Um, then we can go over here and we can say save all these, save all these guys, and uh, you know basically uh, create some pets here. Uh, Dino, uh, what were the components? Uh, name, age, age, and owner. Uh, and maybe you know we want to you know have uh, another secondary constructor in pet that lets me specify the pet type because that's kind of something that I've lost the ability to do. Uh, pet type. type. I don't know. You know it doesn't need to be qualified. Put that in there. Right. Okay. So now we can have Dino. And we can have baby puss. Baby puss is a pet type cat, right? So I get to, to um, so now you know you can see this is transactional. Basically, it'll go run in a transaction. If anything goes wrong, some, it'll will get a failure. And now when you drop into uh, terminal here, if when if I do gradle w run t. What's actually going to happen is um, it's going to start the test containers uh, server, uh, which will spin up my MySQL instance, right? So my MySQL instance is running inside of a test container. Uh, I don't have to install a database locally. I don't have to set up MySQL and external the container just spun up for me, right? Now it took longer to start up. It took 18 seconds. I'm waiting. I'm waiting more time for my thing to start up, but the cool thing is, Micronaut is going to manage that container. You know, so so if I if I come in and I modify my application here and I add a print line, uh, and you know, just to say that I'm saving some pets or whatever, you know, probably I should use a login framework. But I, if I save that, uh, Micronaut will recompile and restart the um, the server. But without restarting the container, so the container is being managed by Micronaut, right? And what's cool as well is that if I flip over and start running my tests, right? So if I run my test hit from here, uh, the execution of my test will actually connect to my existing running container, right? So I don't, I don't have to. I can run my tests, and uh, my tests failed to run for an error um, because, okay, so. Um, so this is interesting. So I'm getting an error because the 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 argument for owner is null, and this is actually something that I want to change in Micronaut data and detect this error at compilation time. So this is a future improvement that we can make. But basically, pet is a record. It has a constructor argument that is the owner. Therefore, in order to retrieve a pet, I must also retrieve the owner. Therefore, in order to do that. I actually need to apply a join, right? In SQL, we don't in Micronaut Data JDBC we don't support um, lazy loading like in Hibernate, right? So you have to, so it forces you to specify your joins ahead of time, right? So I just say I want to join owner, um, and uh, and then uh, it'll apply a join and fetch the owners of the pet in the same query, right? Uh, now, what's cool about Micronaut Data as well is you can also query across associations. So you can do things like list all the pets where find by uh, owner name is something, right? So in this case, I can find all the all the pets by the owner's name. The name is the the name is a property of owner, right? So I'm actually querying across. Relational tables, right? And 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 and, and, and Micronaut Data is smart enough to work that out. Otherwise, you can provide uh, apply joins. Okay, so um, with that in place, <coughs> basically, um, and I think uh, with that in place, and also I think I'm trying to now. I'm probably going to. Otherwise, this is not going to work. But I'm going to probably have to make these types serializable uh, for this demo. To otherwise, it won't. Yeah, you know, Micronaut serialization will not let me serialize these types, which is probably good. You probably shouldn't actually, and we'll get to a minute about serializing directly 
types that manage that are represent your database entities. Um, but be, you can see that basically um, now my test passes that I can run my tests and my test execution is still fast because it's using the existing running MySQL instance that I, that I started when I was running when I when I did run. So it's using uh, the the server this container this MySQL container that was started in this process, right? So it's sharing um, test resources containers between my test execution and my running application, which is really powerful because otherwise, if I stop the server, if I stop the server and I run my test, now, now my t container will have gone away and basically it's going to have to restart the MySQL container uh, in order to be able to run my test which means that it's going to take longer to run my tests. So my feedback loop when I'm, I'm running my tests and I'm waiting to see the changes, I'm running my tests and waiting to see the changes, is longer. I'm suffering. I have to wait for my MySQL instance to start up before I can see the result of my test. That's annoying, right? That's really annoying. This, the, the powerful thing about Micronauts test resources integration is that it's this container reuse, so we improve developer productivity, right? And that's really, really powerful. Uh, now, uh, the other th cool thing about Micronaut Data is how it lets, it lets you use uh, data transfer objects. So I can, I can come in here and, um, and I can say, you know, like for example, pet, you know, this, this, this type already has a lot of data, right? It's got like the ID, the name, the age, the owner, the pet type. Maybe, maybe well, I don't want to send all of that over the wire, right? So you can actually create DTOs using records. So I can say, create me a, a, a name, and age DTO, right? And in here I can say, you know, I only want the name and the age. And I, this is going to be uh, serializable, right? And then I can come into my repository and then say, uh, instead of listing like all the data, including all the pets, I don't want to have to join the record. I just want the name and the age, right? I just want the name and, and the age DTO. I just want the data that I need. Um, uh, actually, I think that conflicts. So actually, well, I, have, I need to have a different method. I have to have list uh, name and age DTO. So I'm going to list all the data. And, and Micronaut data is, is, is smart enough. Uh, so list to basically uh, fetch only the data that I'm interested in. So it'll optimize the SQL select to just select the name and the age and, and apply the query and, and, re and return just the subset of the data that you need by supplying a DTO. Um, so that's a really cool feature as well. And you, know, you can also, if, you, if you're not happy with anything that Microsoft Data is do doing, you can come in here and say, I want to make this, I want to write the query. I want to say select star, you know, or select star from pet where name equals uh, name. And I want to write the query. I want to be in full control of the SQL query. I don't want to bind that to that parameter, right? And we do type checking to, bi to bind the, the parameters. So if you specify one of these and it doesn't exist here, you get a compilation error. So my grant data is really, really powerful. Um, and this is just one implementation, right? I, I, you can also drop in. I'm not going to have time to show all the implementations, but basically, uh, you, 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 we have uh, reactive implementations. So you can, instead of, uh, you basically uh, choose Micronaut Data RTDBC, and instead of returning a list and, and, mo and optional, you return flux and mono, and, um, and you can use uh, reactive, fully reactive programming. It supports CRUD. Um, we, ha we just recently, released Micronaut Data MongoDB. Uh, so you can use it against you know, MongoDB workloads. Uh, we have, for MongoDB, we, we have both reactive and synchronous implementations. We support JPA, we support J, JDBC, uh, and we work, we're work, working on a lot more um, uh, for in the future. So Micronaut Data is a big focus we, you know, in, in, in the next few months um, of, of where our energy is going into making, making Micronaut Data more and more awesome. Uh, so, 
uh, where, to, where can you learn more? So you know, we've already gone through a lot, but I could spend the entire day talking to you guys and, and not cover it all, right? We could, we could, we could make this a four-day training session and I'll keep going, right? <laughs> but, but, but there's a lot of material out there, right? So you have um, in the Micronaut documentation, you have the guides. Um, uh, so a good destination, right, is, is guides.micronaut.io, right? You go there. And we have getting started from creating your first Micronaut application to creating your, you know, your first Graal VM application to kind of get a getting started type material. Um, we have you know, material on Micronaut Data JDBC. And the cool thing about the guides is you can go into them and uh, we have this grid, which we could make better. But um, basically, you choose your build tool, you choose your language. Uh, and we have customized guides, and they're all in the nasty doc. And each and each one is tested continuously with each Micronaut release. And also, we produce a zip file that you can download with each guide. So you get the sample code, you get the guide, you get the tutorial. It shows you how to create the app, and it steps you through step by step on you know how to how to um, to to look. You should follow us on social as well, Micronaut Framework and Graal VM. Check out the Graal VM docs. Um, and now let's talk about what's coming before we get to a bit of Q&A. So Micronaut 4 is the next uh, um, release we're focusing on, which we're, we're talking, targeting in the next few months. Um, so we'll continue to maintain Micronaut 3 for some time, but Micronaut 4 will baseline on Java 17. So Java 17 will be the minimum version that you can use Micronaut 4 with. If you want Java 8, if you want Java 11, you can continue to use Micronaut 3. It's fantastic. It's still great, you know, and we'll continue to maintain it. Um, we're also doing initial investigative work on supporting virtual threads and Loom. Uh, there are a few areas where we haven't migrated to the Jakarta namespace. You saw validation, so we have to do that. It's also, uh, Micronaut uses semantic versioning. So if we want to upgrade to a new third-party library major versions. We can only do that in a new major release of Micronaut. So there are some libraries like Kafka 3, for example, uh, that we can only ship with Micronaut 4. Um, we're also going to focus on more Micronaut data amazingness. That's what I told. As I said before, we're you know, working on like cloud, de uh, cloud databases. Um, and we also have a large Kotlin audience. So there's a lot of people using Kotlin. I use Java in all the demos, but we we have a large Kotlin audience, so uh, Kotlin support for KSP, which is a, a replacement for annotation processing, um, is something we're looking at for Micronaut 4, like either 4 or 4.1, we'll see. So I'll leave you with that. The future is intelligent compiler, smaller linear runtimes, and Micronaut is continuing to evolve and, and to tackle new use cases. You know, since I, since I gave, um, a deep dive last time in, in, in DevOps, you know, we, 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 the test resources support didn't exist, Micronaut AOT didn't exist, Micronaut serialization didn't exist. We only had Micronaut data JPA, you know, huge amounts of work has gone into Micronaut in the last three years and has really come on uh, in leaps and bounds. It's better than ever, great time to try it out uh, if you haven't tried it out already. So in summary, and we'll have you know, time for you to go and come and ask me questions, but um, the Micronaut framework provides an awesome set of like framework building blocks where you know we started from the bottom layer to think about how we can reinvent the whole structure of a framework to not base it on reflection, to not base it on runtime logic, and um, and it, it provides that foundation that that is that is awesome. It uh, it sacrifices a little bit of compilation speed. Uh, by plugging into Java C, but not much, and you know, even and even in native image, you know, it sacrifices, you know, compilation speed, but you gain so much. It allows you to take Java applications where they could not go before. You know, building we have folks building Micronaut um, applications and deploying them to you know serverless cloud environments that would never have considered Java for that workload before. It, it fixes the cold start problem, right? Uh, command line applications, um, low memory service uh, microservices where you need to scale out to you know dozens or hundreds of pod, pods in Kubernetes. Um, you know it's allowing Java to do solve more use cases. 
And, um, and you know, by reducing inflection, we allow that easier closed world better analysis for the native image tuning. But productivity is also really important to us. So we, wanna, we want all of these features. We want it all. We want the high productivity, but without paying the performance penalty, penalty of using traditional runtime characters um, features of the Java language. Right. Thank you very much. Um, if you have questions, you can come over here. Uh, and I'll be around, and, and you know, so I hope you enjoyed the talk, and it was great having you, and I'm glad you all stuck it out for the three hours. It was awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.